Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, glad to see around 70 people joining us today for this MIST training, which is more related to API, advanced developer sessions, and, and some MIST internals too, and some MIST administrations. Um, compared to the session that we did yesterday, um, this one will be a bit more interactive. Um, as the API topic is quite large, uh, we would like to get your feedback, or if you have any questions, I will try to answer them live, especially that when we talk about API, we might have specific requests or things like that. Um, so that's um, one way to do it. Uh, so don't hesitate to use the chat uh, in uh, the Zoom. Uh, the session will be recorded. Uh, training materials will be then later on available. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, uh, that's it for me, I think. Yep. So hello, everyone. Um, so today, it's, as Alex mentioned, about uh, advanced topic, developer session, and API to MISP internals. Um, but before saying all of that, I think it's always good to have a quick reminder of the different, let's say, administration aspect that we have in MISP. So we'll take uh, like something like 30 minutes to go over different topics such as organization, users, role, and permissions, synchronization, sharing groups, uh, settings, and so on. So for those who are already familiar with all of these concepts, uh, bear with us. Uh, and if you are new and discover MISP, uh, discovering MISP, I think it will be quite interesting for you. And this part is quite important for the one operating a MISP instance because Absolutely. you basically get all the information how to operate it on a day-to-day -day basis, especially to do the basis administrations uh, aspect. All right. So um, not sure if the people that join after I pasted the link can see it. So I will paste it again. Um, so this is the document that you are currently seeing on screen. So it has uh, like access to the training instance if you want to play with a MISP instance uh, and explore with us the different concepts. Uh, we, you also have access to the some resources, interesting resources such as the cheat sheet, the, some training materials, and so on. Okay, so let's. Go to the training instance. Yeah, as Alex mentioned, do not hesitate to use the chat if you have any question. Uh, it is it is going to be pretty interactive. So if there is there is something not clear um, or something that needs to to be bring up um, in the in the session will right away uh, talk about it all right so let's start um, administration in in misp if you remember yesterday we cover a lot of aspects especially about creating data in misp and i've mentioned it or uh, multiple times during yesterday's session we have this concept of ownership of events, uh, such as, for example, in this case, you can see that this um, event was created by uh, the training organization, and it's also owned on this instance by the training organization. Uh, so we'll cover quickly what these organizations are and what they mean in MISP. So if you are an administrator on the MISP instance, you can reach the administration index by going in administration and then list organization. Uh, and then you are provided a table that contains all the organization that we have on this instance. So right now we have a total of 56 organization. These are fake organization just for training purposes. Um, so what, what do we have uh, as field for an organization? Well, we have a name, we have a new ID. This is very important. Organization UIDs are the ones that are transient between MISP instances. So whenever you're sharing data, uh, the organization name doesn't really matter. What actually matters is the UID. So if you're operating multiple MISP instances, your organization should have the same UID on all of these MISP instances. Same when you um, ask for access to other MISP instances, um, you should provide the, the operator your organization UID so that uh, ownership is properly handled. Uh, and yeah. Main, mainly that actually, ownership of event and what you can see, especially when dealing with sharing groups. So, so you have to see the UID as a global identifier, and this global identifier should be the same 
across the different instances for the same organizations. But don't worry, if you do a mistake, you'll see that you can work around it. Um, then we have other fields such as uh, nationality, uh, sector, type, uh, so on. These are just meta fields um, that are well useful when you're operating communities. Um, for example, if we if you are in an Isaac um, or a large community of multiple nationalities, so we good good to have. But yeah, this is just this is not used by MISP itself to identify things. Uh, it's just like meta meta information. Um, yeah, and then we have uh, yeah, the amount of users and some restriction that we can have. Um, but to, to cover this field, I propose that we show how you can create an organization. And I guess this will cover most of the question that you might still have. So to create an organization, you click on Add Organization. <clears throat> then you can decide first um, if this is a local organization or not. So this one, it explains it a bit, what does what it means. But basically, if you are creating an organization that is meant to have users on this MISP instance, you will check this local organization. Uh, then you have to add an identifier of that organization, and this is mainly the name of the organization. Um, so in our case, I don't know, we could say uh, demo organization. If this demo organization already exists in another MISP instance, you can paste the UID of that organization there. Otherwise, you just click Generate UID and this will do it for you. And then you have some optional fields that you are not forced to fill out. A description, uh, with, uh, yeah. We have this bind user account to domain uh, option that you can use. Um, if you are running a huge community, I think it's very important that you do it. If it's just for your internal uh, business, let's say, I mean, you can just leave it empty. It's not that big of a deal. I can provide a logo, nationality, sector, type of organization. Again, these are meta information. Useful if you are part of a community. If you are not, uh, well, and you are, if you are not and you are not planning to share, uh, then you can leave it empty. It's becoming very interesting when you have a large uh, MISC community where multiple users and organizations are your, on your instance uh, for doing, I would say, day-to-day -day operation and administrations. It's much more easier when you have the uh, meta field uh, set up. Um, as an example, we have a colleague, a German colleague, which is like super picky of mm -hmm. all the meta fields and so on, but it's really safe or light. Um, when you have to have, uh, do, uh, for example, statistics using the API and, for example, classifying organization based on their nationality or sector of activities and so on. So even if you start small, already uh, feed the meta feed is important. Yeah, actually, this is very good advice, especially that, as uh, Alex mentioned, you can filter data based on the creator organization and based on this meta field. So if you know that uh, uh, you want, well, if you want to get data that was created by organization being from, example, the financial sector, then you could ask MISP to, okay, I want to see all data that has been created by organization belonging to the financial sector. All right, but yeah, in this case, let's just leave it empty. And then you hit submit. So let's go back to our organization index. Um, and let's go over this local flag once again. So if you remember when we were creating this organization, we had this local organization. And I said that it was to indicate to MISP that this organization can have users. Right now, we are view viewing the table of organizations that are local, but you also have organizations that are known by MISP that are not local. In this example, we have 60. For example, let's take the first one, Quadruple A. Um, this organization is known to MISP, uh, but cannot have users. As you can see, they all have zero users. So why do we have this organization there? Um, MISP is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, software uh, where you share data. And sometimes you will receive data that was created by someone you, do, you don't know. So let's say you are synchronizing data from, uh, from an Isaac, and, and over there, there is an organization that, that you don't know about. MISP will always remember who created the data, so who created the event, 
And as such, it will carry this organization over to your VISP instance whenever you will synchronize that data. And then this organization will appear in this list. So MISP, your MISP instance will know about this remote organization, um, but as it's not local, you cannot create user for it. Um, right, so we've talked about users. Let's see what it means. Obviously, users are users. So we can access it by going into the administration panel and then list users. <clears throat> Uh, and then you are provided with a list of users. But yeah, <laughs> I have access to this instance. Um, so obviously you can do multiple things with, with users. You can enable users, disable users. Um, this is only if you are an admin. So what else do, what else users have as fields? So all users belong to an organization, as you can see. For example, this is the circle organization, and you can see that some users belong to this one. The training organization has many users as well. And you can see that the user account that you've been provided in the document to access this MISP instance uh, belongs to the training organization. Maybe something important that uh, comes up with, with MISP regarding user and organization. So as Sami mentions, a user is always bound to an organization. Mm -hmm. Um, something to keep in mind, and a lot of organizations are asking that, uh, in MISP, technically the element that is sharing events and so on are organizations, not users. Users are referenced for audit purpose on the local instance, but this information is not shared with other MISP instances. Mm -hmm. So privacy-wise, is always the organization that is sharing and so on. So that's why we bond users to specific organizations. If in your use case, you just have users, then those need to basically bound to a single organization, which will be their own organizations. Um, we do that for, for example, for security researchers, which are really not really bound to an organization. We basically create a kind of, I would say, a, a generic organization for them, which is basically belonging to the, to the user itself. But that's an important concept. Users must always be tied to an organization. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so... Yeah, let's see the process of creating a user then. So you can click on add user. And then it's, I would say pretty standard. So you had, you had an email address. So I created it already. So let's do something like this. Then you can choose to set a password or not. Uh, if you leave it empty, it means we generate a password and send it by mail automatically to the user, provided that you have uh, provided a PGP key. And you have to choose to which organization these users belong to. So you can pick whatever. These are all the organizations that are marked as local. So in this case, we could say that it's, let's say, take a, a fucking ring of bank organization. And then you can decide a role for that user. We'll cover the role in, in a few minutes. So let's just keep user. Uh, NIDS, CCIS ID, you can leave it empty. It's not really that important. It's for export of data. Um, and then you have the PGP key. So if the user provided the PGP key, his PGP key to you, you can just paste it there. If the email address is valid, you can just click on fetch PGP key and the system will yeah, use PGP key server and try to fetch it. We don't have any PGP key for this email address because it's a fake email address. And then we have some other settings that we can change, uh, choose from, uh, like notification, especially. So we have, you can choose um, to send email notification when a new event is published, um, when other users use the contact report feature. Uh, you can also choose to disable this, this user and send the credential automatically. We have a good question uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Veibahat Sharma about the, uh, all the organizations are known and, and so on. As Sami explained, it's, it's really uh, the remote organization that really learn from new events. So that means if you interconnect or ingest feeds in the misformat, you will learn from those new organizations. It doesn't mean that you create any users locally on your instance. It's just that the instance will basically automatically populate these remote organizations with these uh, new information about the organization. Then later on, you can decide that this organization will be local and create additional user there. 
Um, you mentioned in the question if all the remotes are created by circle. We don't have any control on that model. It's basically depending on where you are connected. Obviously, we operate some sharing communities where we create organizations with uh, agree UUIDs and names and so on. But it's up to the connection that you have. So if you have a complete community, I don't know, in India, for example, uh, which are basically different organizations and so on, those are basically set up or at least known by the information share among the different members. And that's it. So there is no central point for that. Nevertheless, we have a directory service it's called Celebrate, um, which can basically operated by some sharing communities to have centralized way of, of sharing those uh, organizations. And in your misp instance, you can have a connections with uh, what you call Celebrate, basically learn additional um, org, and especially with their associated UI. I hope it's answer your questions. If you want some more details, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Yes, Celebrate is a nice tool for uh, doing community management. It's a, you can view it as a companion tool to, to MISP for managing your community. Um, yeah, that was a good question, indeed. Okay, so let, let's say that I'm happy with this user and can just click create it. And if you have emailing set up correctly and you have provided a BGP key, now this user has received an email containing his temporary password. That will uh, that you can use to log in to MISP. All right. So we mentioned roles. So let's have a look at that. So if you go in administration and then list roles, you can view all the roles that exist on this instance. So roles have a name, and then you can assign multiple permissions for that role. Permission that you can see uh, on this table. For example, if we look at the admin role. They basically have all permission enabled. If we look at the user role, you can see that some features are not uh, available to them. For example, uh, organ min features, synchronization action, um, creating tags, creating uh, sharing groups, that kind of uh, functionalities are not available to this role. Um, so by default, I think we have six roles, but you can always create new ones. So if you click on add role, you can give a name, give some permission regarding the management of users for your organization and the publication of your event. Uh, and then you can uh, pick the permission that you want to, to, to give to this specific role. And in addition to that, you can also supply memory limit and execution time, as you can see on the table there. So memory limit allows you to increase the memory envelope that this role can use whenever they use MISP. Um, so, for example, if you're trying to export a lot of data at once, uh, if you have a small memory limit, uh, well, the, the the request will not complete if you if you exhaust this memory limit, basically. And you can change it by just increasing it. So, usually, we have uh, sync action and automation action uh, that requires a lot of memory. So, we usually have a larger pool of memory for these specific roles. And for the other users, uh, we have something more standard. But it's completely under your control. You can always play with it. Uh, and we have the same concept, but not for memory this time. This time it's for execution time. So when you perform a query against MISP, how long can this request take, basically? Uh, so for creating data, this doesn't really matter. It's more about doing complex searches in, in the instance. So if you're trying to search for a very complex, uh, uh, let's say, values, uh, tags, and, and so on, on a very big instance, then uh, ex the execution time of that query may, may, may take some time. Um, and similar reasoning that for uh, the memory limit, usually we increase the execution time for sync action. This is, I would say, less important, but uh, automation is absolutely important. Uh, and then the last one related to, to these two is search by 15 minutes. So by default, they are set to unlimited, meaning that these roles can perform as many searches as they want during this 15 minute time frame. Uh, but so, for some of them, you can also enforce uh, some rate limiting. For example, this automation we have set up a max execution time of 600 seconds, uh, which is twice the amount of the other uh, roles. 
but for this specific one, when fourth, that they can only perform five searches every 15 minutes. And it's not because these holes are created by default that you cannot change them. You can obviously edit the holes and set different values and different permissions. All right. So is there any th anything interesting in the chat? Yes, there's a pretty good question. Mm. Which is maybe not related to administration directly. <laughs> it's about a distribution level, but it's a good point because field management is a kind of administration. That's what you are going to see right after. Yeah, um, but that was more the distribution level. So right. um, Amir Yui is asking about the distribution level. I just want to leave in the chat, but mm -hmm. um, maybe when you will mention the feed and show the feed works, uh, maybe just mention the distribution level. Uh, distribution level in MISC, we already a bit quickly talked about it yesterday, but it's it's basically like you have four default way of distributing plus the sharing groups where you can set up a different sharing groups. And then you're completely in control when you ingest a feed, as long as you set the distribution level, the different distribution level. You can even in the administration aspect of MISP have a default distribution level, um, which is quite important too, because it is really the, the default rule that you set for your instance when you receive your new information there. Um, and you can even define this. Uh, by default, and uh, Sami is actually showing on the user interface uh, the uh, uh, control, which is called the def default event distribution. Is when you create a new event, it's all, all the distribution is set by default. Um, so that's giving already a good good overview. But just later in the in the presentation, we will go into the feed management, and you see that you can uh, basically set the distribution level when creating uh, creating new feeds. Well, let's see synchronization. Then I think it makes sense. So if you go to the sync action uh, tab, then you can access either the feeds, uh, which is to configure feeds, uh, or remote server, which is to configure synchronization to other servers. And I'm quite surprised that we don't have any. Hmm. Seems that someone purged them. <laughs> That's the drawback of giving access to everyone. Um, oh, all right, but we can create a new one and so that we see how, how it goes. Uh, so first, you have to provide the base URL. So basically the, the uh, URL of the instance you want to create a connection to. So let's, let's create a, a look back, a loop back uh, synchronization link. So you just provide the URL and then you can give the instance a name. Uh, so in our case, let's say connection. Then you have to specify the ownership and the different credential on uh, on who is the owner of this uh, of this instance. Uh, so typically, you will add the organization that is the owner of the remote instance. So in our case, the training organization is the owner uh, of uh, of this loopback connection. This is actually a bad example to, to use that. So if we were trying to add a connection to let's say one of Circle's MISP instance. Uh, we know that Circle is the owner organization of that instance, so we would pick Circle there. Uh, but yeah, in our case, as we are creating a loopback, we have to use the owner organization on this instance, which is uh, the training organization. Um, and then you have to provide a not uh, authentication key, authorization key. Uh, yeah, this is quite obvious. I mean. To have access to a MISP instance, you have to prove that you have access to it first, and this can be achieved by using authorization key. Uh, so I'm going to cheat quickly. Uh, and then I can create an authorization key. I will go quickly, uh, but because we'll see once again this process in the API section. Um, then, um, then we can decide uh, which synchronization method we want to support. So we have push, pull, uh, and let's say cache. Let's ignore the other for now. So what does it mean? Push means that this instance is going to push data to the remote one. Okay. So if you create an event and you start the synchronization with the push method, then any event that you have created on your MISP instance will be pushed, will be synchronized to the remote MISP instance. 
the second method is pull. Uh, it's basically pulling data from the remote MISP instance into this local MISP instance. So in the if you have a connection to the circle MISP instance and you are uh, doing a pull synchronization, then your MISP instance will go on the circle instance, download all events, and save them locally. And finally, caching, it's like a pool, but instead of saving the event, you put it in a fast lookup cache so that you can see immediate correlation that you might have in your MISP instance without uh, needing to have all the data locally. This is a very good way and ch cheap uh, and lightweight uh, mechanism to have correlation. For, for example, if you connect for the first time to an instance and you don't really want to pull everything and then basically have all the data locally, doing a caching is really a quick way to get the benefit of this instance um, without having actually the data on your instance. So it's it's, it's nice and uh, um, it's a nice way to test if your connection is working too and uh, and so on. Um, we have some some good question there. Uh, there is one about the filtering between the synchronization between the MISP instances. Mm -hmm. And Sammy will jump after yep. on the uh, filtering aspect and the synchronization aspect, which is, I think, the filtering, um, and I think you might do it multiple times today, of um, describing how to do filters, because mm -hmm. the filters that I use for the synchronizations are exactly the same that I use for the API, mm -hmm. which is a nice thing with MISP. We try to be consistent there. You use a different way to use it, but technically the filtering mechanism is exactly uh, the same. And Martin is asking a question about the caching at sync. Is it correlated by the event ID? Uh, it's it's indeed correlating and pointing back to the UID of the event. So for example, mm -hmm. if you have a hash value uh, from a specific attribute within the event, you have a reference back to the UID of the remote miss instance, and you can even browse remotely um, the, uh, the event. Thanks, Martin, is a good reminder for, mm -hmm. for these yeah. features. Yeah, so the correlation uh, is done on the value itself of the attribute. So like the IP, the URL, the domain name, the file hash, whatever. Um, but what you will see on the interface is the actual event oh. that correlates with it. Um, and Cerebrate considered as a server. Let, you can see Cerebrate as a like service uh, that contains, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly that. It's it's a, so it's a server running your rights thing. Um, in addition to that, it's providing a services to MISP and other tools to you have to see it as a directory. So just think about LDAP. It's like an LDAP server, mm -hmm. uh, but with some specific protocol uh, for connecting with MISP and other tools that support Celebrate too. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's jump back to our server creation. So you have like uh, MISP uh, settings that you can set up. For example, you can ask Miss not to, to unpublish event whenever you synchronize them, to publish them with a the email, to allow and sign certificate, and so on. Uh, but once you are past these settings, you, are, you end up in this section about filtering, where you can set up push rules and pull rules. Uh, let's start with let's start with uh, push rules. So let's say that we are setting up a synchronization with the push mechanism. That means I'm, I'm, I'm I want to send all events that are eligible uh, to a remote MISP instance. But I also want to apply some filtering to this event. So to do that, you can click on this push rule. And in there, you can provide uh, some filtering. So you can provide some, uh, let's say, filtering on tags. So if you want to only push events that are marked with TLP white or TLP clear, you can type TLP and you can select TLP white, you can select TLP clear. And these are the only tag that will be allowed. Uh, you can also do it the other way around and say, okay, I don't want to synchronize any anything related to, uh, I don't know, uh, to ransomware. So in this case, only the event that are marked with TLP white or TLP clear and that are not marked as being ransomware with these tags uh, will be synchronized and will be pushed. And you can do the same uh, filtering strategy, let's say, with organization. So if you want to only say that, okay, only the event from the training organization can be synchronized, uh, you can do it like this. You have to see it as a kind of allow list. Mm -hmm. um, so it's either an allow list or a block list. 
Um, so to answer the question of uh, Ami Rui uh, about the uh, synchronization MIS2, MIS, and so on, about TLP classification, TLP protocol is exactly that what Sam is showing there. Um, we will just push information that is like, for example, clear out and just TLP clear. Uh, and we want to really be sure that, for example, internal non-review information is not shared when you set the proper tags. Or mm -hmm. this is the example here is just uh, on the So it's, it's, it's pretty flexible. Um, and you can combine those kind of rules uh, with uh, different uh, tags and organizations, which is sometimes what you want to do. Sometimes you set up a synchronization with a single organization and you want them to uh, only get this information from a specific creator organizations only. That's one way to do it. Um, there are multiple. Yesterday we discussed about the different sharing mechanism. This one I would say is kind of sharing of the cake on the cake because it's it's the last resource filtering that mm -hmm. you might have on the synchronization aspect. Yeah, and you will see there is a slight difference between the push and the pull rule. So let's just create it as this, and let's have a look at the pull rule. So the pull rule is, as you can see, pretty similar. You can specify which uh, tags you want to. Uh, pull so to download from the remote one. So uh, I don't know why this is wrong. Ah, okay. Well, this, this is a good question so from Duncan. Um, does allow block org in the rules related to the owner org or creator org or both? Uh, in this case, it's, it's always a creator org. Mm -hmm. um, that's, indeed, we didn't have it on the user interface. For us, it's obvious, but not yeah. sometimes obvious. So uh, thanks for the questions. Maybe we should clarify that mm. the user interface. Yeah, this is a good point. Very good point. Yes. Indeed. Uh, okay, so pull rules. Let's see. So now you can see that the interface is slightly different. That's because uh, we are actually fetching the tags that can be used for filtering and the organization that can be used used for filtering based on what's known on the remote server. So yeah, that's a nice UI. Uh, UI feature that, that we have there. That's why I had to, to save it first. But basically now, instead of setting up the push rule for synchronization, we are setting up the pull rule for synchronization. So meaning the, the rule that will be applied whenever you will try to download data from a remote list instance. So we can do the same. We could say that you want to download only thing that is uh, TLP green, uh, TLP, let's say, amber, uh, and TLP. Uh, clear, let's say like this. And you can also specify which org you want to download the data. But in addition to that, you can see that we have a small text input where we can provide more filtering parameters. This one is not available for the push, uh, unfortunately, but we have it for pull. And uh, I think I saw a question about exactly uh, your... time and historical data, yeah. and this is where you can put it. So if in your instance, you want to synchronize to pull only data that is, let's say, um, one year old or uh, younger, let's say, uh, you can use a filtering parameter such as timestamp, three, six, or days. And if you save that, it will do a query against the remote instance. Uh, get the list of all events that are newer uh, than one years old, uh, and then download them. As an example, you you set up a connection with a new instance. You know that they are uh, providing indicator of compromise, TTP from some trail actors and so on, and you know that they have a huge history of like five or seven seven years of data that like we have on, on this uh, this private sector. Uh, but you want to restrict, for example, you really want to to be interested into the fresh information. So the publish timestamp limit that uh, Sami just uh, set with a um, year as uh, the number of days can be set there too. And this filtering rule is actually the, the same on the open API that we use for the index because it's using the API in the backend. Um, so all the parameters that you have for the index filtering are available to that. Um, so that means you can specify the timestamp, you can, uh, for example, say it's published, unpublished. Uh, for example, you can even pull sometimes information that are unpublished. Uh, specific tags, you can even uh, specify time range there um, and, and stuff like that. So uh, even the published timestamp, so you can even fine tune what kind of information if you want to have a refresh information, even if it's old and you get updates, uh, you can basically set this kind of, of, of rule there. Um, yeah, so I reply to, to the question about the, the cheat sheet parameters for this one. Um, so 
we'll, we'll come back to the to this discussion about timestamp and publish timestamp later in the API section. So once you're happy with this filtering rule, you can hit submit. Uh, we also check cache so that we have it. So the, Daniele is asking about is there more time identifiers for timestamp on those on day? Of course, you can set hours, you can set years, and so on. So it's basically the one that is used for I think PHP. If I recall correctly, so oh, yeah. you, you can really express complex things. Like two fortnight ago. <laughs> yeah, this works. <laughs> this works. So, uh, so if your time references are just based on nights, I don't know what you're doing the night, but you can use it. <laughs> um, so that's basically the same. So you can use a D days, for example, uh, why alone works, uh, year. So it, it can be the complete. Um, uh, we can send a link, which is completely documented. So that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's pretty standard. Um. Yeah. So all right. So now we have created our loopback connection. So <laughs> that doesn't do much um, because we'll never be able to pull something that already exists on our instance. But still, we can do some some few tests. So once you have created your uh, your server, you can test the connection. So if you click on this one, it will do a quick connection test uh, so that we see the local version of our server, the version of the remote server, if it is compatible, uh, if uh, connection was okay. And then you have this really weird and cryptic uh, uh, post test uh, that say that received the same package. Uh, this is uh, because sometimes when you involve proxies uh, or interceptors uh, in front of other MISP instances, sometimes they, they strip uh, the payload of post request. Uh, so if, if you have an issue with your synchronization, do a quick uh, run connection test and if, if the issue is related to these kind of uh, proxy proxy issues, uh, you will not you will have a message there explaining what's what what went wrong. Yeah, it's usually useful when you debug connections and you are asking uh, some questions. We have a good question from uh, mm -hmm. Val Vadaf about the warning list. Are they enforced for sync to sync connections? They are not. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is important there, and that's maybe going back to a kind of golden rule in MISP, um, where we say okay be lax in what you ingest, and then you uh, filter out what you don't need. Uh, so when you synchronize MISP instances that may be connected with others, we don't really want to apply filtering rules or warning lists that are basically bound to a specific organization or a specific uh, nodes. Um, so what you, we propose, and that's the thing that is usually the default practice, is to enforce the warning list uh, through the usage of the API or through the UI because you get a warning about this. Uh, Sami is showing the parameters. So for any API request, you can basically enforce the warning list, which is basically a, a, a way to uh, to be sure that you don't feed any information that are matching warning list. So sync to sync, we don't do warning list um, for obvious reason that we don't want that data are basically modified in transit, then resynchronize and so on. With because warning lists are are something that are uh, I would say custom organizations even between our team. And I remember we had yeah. some sometimes discussion between Sammy and I about warning lists and so on. And we are not going to a bar fight, but close to it, uh, just to see uh, it's a warning list that we need to apply and so on. So that's why it's really, I would say, personal view there. That's why it's, it's not in the situation. We have an additional question about missed guard. Oh, yeah. um, uh, so I think Merlin is, is kind of advanced user because not everyone from Common user of MISP knows about it. So MISGART is, is an actual extension um, to support very specific use cases of synchronizations when they need additional enforcement rules. So Sami showed to you a way to create synchronizations, filter out, which is kind of already kind of advanced uh, filtering mechanism. Then we have a tool that are independent from MISP itself, which can be even as, as a second controller, where you can basically create rules and filter that. It's based on... Uh, Man the middle proxy, um, which is a pretty advanced um, uh, software for doing man the middle interception and so on into synchronizations. Um, so you can you can use that for doing controls and additional controls. It's really useful for I would say intelligence organization and military organizations, which have very strict rule with classified networks. Uh, so it's a it's, it's a kind of balance between completely air gap system and completely synchronized system. Just a side note because maybe some of you are asking. What kind of protocol is used for the synchronizations? And that's the nice thing with, with MISP. It's a pure TLS connections. Uh, these are one-way connections. Um, so if you have to open firewalls, things like that, 
um, you can just use a normal TLS. So there's no kind of black magic. We don't have random port, things like that. It's, it's pure TLS. And MISGARD is basically just a kind of intercepting device or software to just you know, interconnect there uh, between the two. I will give a link to, to MISGARD. Yeah, and if you have any additional question with MISGARD, we can uh, uh, we can even bring on board uh, the core developer of MISGARD if he has uh, five minutes so you can see. You can do some live session there. Mm. Um, okay, yeah. So let's go back to our list of the servers. So you can check the connection. You can check which users has been configured uh, to do the synchronization. Now, I've... I used my local user to do that. Usually that's not what you do. Uh, the proper way to do it uh, is to create a sync user. So if you remember in the list of uh, roles, we have this special role called, called sync user, and this one has the sync action. Uh, it is a special role meant for synchronization purposes. And this is actually the, the correct way to do it. So you create a sync user on the remote instance and mm -hmm. um, and and then you um, uh, you you use the API key of that sync user over there. Uh, you can quickly reset the API key and so on. And then if you look at the right side, you can do multiple actions. Uh, the first one is you can explore the, inst the remote instance. So if you were to click on this one. We will switch to a view, as it's say, with a big warning, that we are currently viewing the event index on the remote instance. So right now, we are viewing the data that is stored on the remote MISP instance, but we are viewing it in our own instance. So this is this view is quite interesting, especially when you want to cherry pick uh, event that you want to save locally. For example, if this ransomware infection via email that we created yesterday is really interesting for you, and you would like to, to have it locally, then you can click on this button, fetch the event, and your MISP instance will download the event that is stored remotely and save it locally. So this is the explore mission button. Then you have the pull update to event that already exists locally. So if you have events that have been synchronized or that you knew uh, from any sources uh, that exist locally, then you can ask your MISP instance to update these event, these events based on what is known on the remote instance. Uh, so yeah, this is basically just update what, what is known. Mm -hmm. We have two interesting questions. I think the first one from uh, Amir Rui is about, uh, as an owner of MISP instance, can I handle the permissions on which event or feed that can be viewed by other MISP that sync to the MISP instance and not letting them to choose by themselves on which event they can view once they start it uh, to pull the feed from my events. I'm um, not sure I fully understand the questions, but for my understanding, what you want to achieve is, is basically what you control and how you set the distributions of that event. Um, basically, if you give access to your instance, you will, they will, the user will get access to the uh, thing that they can see, so basically, events, attributes, and so on that are matching their organizations, matching the different rules, and so on. Um, so you basically, when people are pulling, they will only pull this additional, uh, this uh, uh, user directly, uh, so that are matching the different rules. So uh, that's the only way to control it, because you basically give access to your instance, and the instance is basically bound to the ACL of the specific users. Except if Sami found it in a different way, but... Um, I was resolving for... Uh... Issue. <laughs> ah, okay, so sorry. Now it's... Yeah, now I have power. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. Um, there is another question about we receive this error for some even sync by a sync user, try to set a sharing group to the UID me, but the user doesn't belong to it. Does the sync user need to be inside and me to create sharing? Okay, this is a common uh, issue that you have when you set up synchronization link. Um, if you use an admin account to do the synchronization, then you will be able to download uh, the sharing group on the remote side. But when you try to save it on the local side, if you're not part of the sharing group, you, you will have an issue. So this means that you have that one of the synchronization link has been misconfigured. 
So yeah, it's it's obviously not a sync user then. Yeah, because a sync user is a kind of power user that you basically because he can uh, basically kind of spoof users and and sharing groups. So that's kind of an interesting thing. But uh, be careful there uh, to um, uh, to be sure that the synchronization and 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 double check the the, the roles um, because you have a check. Uh, so in the sync user on the connection, you have this uh, role name, this admin, but I would actually looked on the remote instance to be unsure that those role is matching what we expect for admin. We check the admin, but we don't check the complete uh, mm -hmm. sets. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's a good point. Maybe we should also add like a full site admin flag. Exactly. And if it's yes, then show more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Okay, so I will let some more questions come in. I will continue. Yeah, if sure. there is anything interesting, uh, we, 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 can, we can go over so that I can uh, finish with these the different actions that you can do with uh, synchronization. So you can update whatever you have locally. We've talked about that. Then you have the pool all. So by clicking on this button, you will start a job that will go on the remote MISP instance and download everything that is there, provided that they are passing passing the, the filtering rules. So this one, pool rules, will be applied. And then you will download every event that uh, satisfies the pool rule. Then we have the exact same, but the other way around, so for push. So you, you have all your events locally. Then you will apply the push rule to filter out events that do not well, that shouldn't be synchronized. And once you have the event that should be synchronized, you will push, so send everything and synchronize it with the remote instance. And uh, the, the two last one are for editing the server connection and removing it. And the last option is cache instance. So caching the instance uh, is, uh, as we mentioned, it will go on the remote instance. It will go through all attribute values, uh, create a hash out of it, and save it locally in a fast uh, in a fast lookup store, so that we have correlations. So depending on the um, remote MISP instance that you are creating a synchronization with, uh, this can be really, really good to create a cache instead of pulling all the information in. For example, we have uh, here at Circle uh, an instance which is meant for uh, Onipod collection and for um, phishing collection. These instances are massive. They, they contain a lot of data and junk data. And on our production instance, we don't have to, we don't want to have all of this data. But we are still interested to see the correlation uh, to to these instances. So what we do is we set up uh, the cache and we have a, like a job that cache it on a regular basis. So that whenever we are viewing or creating data um, and we create, let's say, for example, uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have a phishing incident and then this phishing was already known by our honeypot or whatever, then we see the correlation immediately. And if it makes sense, uh, we can always download the remote event later on. So there are also other options that we didn't cover, such as push sightings, uh, push and pull galaxy clusters. Uh, this is exactly the same concept than the push and pull. The difference is it's not about event, it's about like context galaxy clusters and also about the sightings. Okay, so now let's have a look at the feeds and you will see that it's pretty similar. So sync action feeds. Um, so you can see if you have a bunch of feeds and let's have a look, for example, at the first one. So I will try to edit it and let's see what we have. So you can, you can enable the caching, can enable the feed, uh, specify if the lookup will be visible. If you want to disable and enable the correlation, you can give a name to this feed, uh, who's the provider. Uh, if this feed is coming from the network or a local file that you have on the server, this can be sometimes useful if you want, for example, to, to skip the, the MISP card limitation that was mentioned in the chat. That's something that you could do to have an external script, download the data locally, uh, and then use the feed uh, as a local source uh, to, to feed it directly so that you basically bypass the uh, filtering restriction enforced by MISP card. Then if, if it's a network, you provide the URL. You have to provide the source format, so the format of the feed you are trying to add. You can choose between the MISP feed, which is the MISP core format feed, let's say, 
a free text parse feed or a CSV feed. And then you can provide like authorization headers, uh, set the default distribution that should be enforced on the feed, uh, and if any tags should be applied by default. And we also have the filter rules uh, similar than the, the one for pool. So if we have a look at this feed, you can see that it's basically a bunch of JSON files with a manifest and a hash file. And that's pretty much it. So once you have that feed imported, what can you do with it? Uh, first, you can explore the event. So you click on it. I can see all the events that are contained in this feed. So I can see it's pretty old. We have some events that are that date back to uh, from uh, 2015. Um, and if we consider this one to be interesting, we can download it locally. We can fetch all events. So this will download all events that uh, are contained in this feed. And this one is download feed metadata as JSON. So if you created a specific feed and you want to reuse this feed configuration on other BISP instances, you can just download the feed metadata. And then you have a quick import uh, tool here in import feed from JSON. You paste the configuration there and it creates the, the feed automatically. And then last but not least, and I think that's the most important one is the caching. So instead of downloading the event from this feed locally, you can do similar than what we saw for the event, uh, for the server is to cache the data that is on the feed so that you have quick correlation. Okay, so this was an example for the MISP feed core format, but we also have other examples. Uh, let's try, I don't know. Or exit nodes. Uh, maybe let's hope it doesn't have rate limiting. So we can see that this uh, this uh, list all the Tor exit nodes uh, as a CSV file or free text. Um, and it has been configured to be a CSV type of feed. And if we look at the configuration, you can see that we have the URL. We specify that is that it's a simple CSV format. But as it is not a MISP core format, you have to um, set who is the creator of the data. Uh, because on the MISP core format, you remember an event always have a creator organization. So in this case, a UID that says who created this event. As you are downloading information that is not under the MISP core format, so it's a CSV, you have to assign an organization that is the creator of the data. So in our case, we could say that it uh, yeah, underscores us. Um, then you have this target event. Uh, and we can see that option a bit like a strategy on how to save this data. So whenever you will pull this v CSV feed, um, you can choose between either create a new event each time you pull it, or to reuse the same event and keep it up to date based on the feed data. So usually you would use fixed event. Uh, the only time you would use new event, new event each pool is when you want to have some history of what evolved over time. Just be careful if you want to use this one as you will have a lot of duplication of data. Uh, because yeah, if the feed doesn't change and you pull it every hour, then Every hour, you will have the same data over and over. That's why we have fixed event by default. Uh, if the an event already has been assigned to this feed, uh, this uh, uh, input will be pre-filled. Uh, if, if it's the first time you will pull it, then leave it empty and it will be filled automatically. And then you can provide like some value that you can find in the CSV so that you can specify in which column you are interested in. Interest that in uh, the delimiter, some regex. Um, yeah, another option such as automatically publish the event uh, that will be created from this feed if the IDS flag should be overridden and delta merge is uh, uh, a strategy used whenever you will update the existing event if it should remove 
the, the data that is not on the field or if it should keep it. And yeah, last but not least, you can override the distribution and set uh, a tag to be applied. All right, so I think that covers it pretty extensively, more than what I think was needed. Um, is there any question of interest or should we move to another topic? No, there was one good question about feeds, um, where logs are of the feeds. Um, so they are basically uh, on the miss directory app temp logs. So you have an error logs. Uh, so if you have any, uh, I would say, sheets that are giving a 403, 404, things like that, you can find this uh, link um, the, there indirectly in the, uh, uh, in the log file of, of MIST. Uh, you might have different one because be careful, it's external feeds. Um, for example, a good example is a Tor one as a restriction on the number of connections that you can do on, the, on a daily basis. Uh, so you might end up with a 403 very, uh, very quickly. Yeah. Um, I'll try again. I'll try to, to yeah. figure this uh, for Mo was asking about uh, pulling feeds and so on automatically. Uh, so I, I gave a list uh, in the chat on um, uh, using the uh, CLI admin mm -hmm. to uh, pull uh, PIND. There is no way to do it through the UI. Um, so you can just trigger one time if you want. Uh, but all the thing is, why it's through the CLI, it makes sense because it's a lot of organizations have uh, their own con jobs things like that to pull the data and their own rules. So you can just call it from the API. Uh, if you want to instrument it through Ansible or whatever, you can do it as, as you want. Um, so that's that's something to, to keep in mind. It's uh, um, and, and the documentation for the command line, uh, Mo is available on the MISP uh, doc, uh, book uh, directly and we have all the documentation there. And then he, had, he has another question, but I'm not sure I, I fully get the question. Can we also set thread feeds to automatically update once in a day? Yes, you can basically um, do it through a cron job on a daily mm -hmm. basis. If you are used to cron job in Unix, which is a classical way of doing it, uh, you can do it on a, on a daily basis. Um, and um, so, yeah, you say, can you guide me how to do it? Yeah, just a cron job. So it's mm -hmm. a classical thing in Unix. Um, there's a last question. What is the best way to export all the events and attributes from one MISP instance to a new MISP instance? Both are internally hosted. Oh, that's an easy answer. Um, we have a feature in synchronization called local. Um, so uh, some show connections and there's a specific flag there, this internal instance. So you basically synchronize all the existing uh, events between the two without applying those um, uh, distribution rules. So um, when you don't set, set that automatically, MISP is uh, decrementing distribution level of the different events. But if you set to local in the same organization, obviously those two MISP need to be in the same org. Uh, so you might have uh, organization A and A on both sides. So it's basically an internal one and you can synchronize everything. Uh, unfortunately, you can uh, in, in synchronize users, uh, but you can synchronize a complete event and synchronize it. It's one way to do it. Uh, for doing, uh, for example, a new installations, new instance, you just synchronize with uh, with the local instance, internal instance. Mm -hmm. uh, so just be careful to behave the same, do same organization on both. Good. And it's pretty cool to have so many good questions today. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's cover quickly sharing groups. So we can access sharing groups by going into the global action menu and then click on list sharing groups. Uh, so as a reminder, sharing groups um, are a distribution level that you can use. And sharing groups are basically a list of organization uh, for which an event can be viewed and shared with. Uh, let's have a look how you can create a sharing group and what are the different parameters and how you can use it. So create the sharing group, just click on add. And then you have to provide a new ID. Uh, well, I think I've never actually pasted a UID there uh, because uh, usually sharing groups, I learn them uh, from external service, such as mismatch synchronization or by using Cerebrate because Cerebrate is a repository of organization, but also a repository of sharing groups. Uh, but if you are creating a sharing group that already exists and that you know the UID of, just paste the UID there. Otherwise, just leave it empty and this will generate a fresh one for you. Uh, then you have to give a name to that sharing group. 
exactly the same discussion than for the organization. This is just for users' consumption, the name. Uh, the actual things that matter for MISP is the UID. Um, so the name could be... Then you have this field, releasable to and description. Uh, so releasable to is also meant for human consumption. Why you would describe who is supposed uh, to, to be part of that sharing group? Um, to whom should the data under that sharing group uh, be releasable to? Uh, so in our case, you could say all organization part of the training core. I could put something also like, I don't know, all financial institution based in Luxembourg, for example. A description similar. If you need to provide more description about that sharing group, you can do it there. Um, then the last checkbox is to make a sharing group selectable or active. It means that you can use it whenever you are creating data. We'll see an example later on. Then you can hit next page and you will be provided an interface to add um, organization to that sharing group. So as the training organization, this is the organization I'm part of, um, is creating the sharing group. This organization is automatically added to the sharing group. But obviously you can add more organization. So if you want to, let's say, add a circle, I could add circle and let's add another one. Let's add team organization. Now I've added these two organizations. So if I create data and I use this, uh, an example sharing group, then these three organizations will be able to view the data. Any other organization that are part of the instance will not be able to see it. Um, yeah, you can add a local or remote organization. This is the same discussion, local and remote is decided with the local flag that you have at organization level. Then you have the MISP instance. So this interface allows you to specify to which server can this sharing group be synchronized with. So we have two modes, let's say. The first one is the roaming mode. It means no restriction, uh, as long as the server is eligible for, the, for having that sharing group, meaning that one of, well, the owner of the server is part of the sharing group. And the second mode is, well, no roaming mode, but then you have to specify which organ, which server can have uh, access to that sharing group. So I think it would be interesting now to have to look at a small diagram. Going back to, to sharing groups, there, were, there was a question about how to limit access to specific events to some organizations when you have an access to a remote instance. Uh, that's exactly what you do is using actually using sharing group. Uh, for limiting the distribution level and the distribution of information. So sharing group can be applied at even level, but they can even be applied on a um, specific uh, object or even on attribute level. So which basically allow to have kind of, of mixed things. If you want to restrict specific information to some organizations, you just basically create a sharing group. So that's the way to do it. I don't remember who asked the questions, but uh, basically creating sharing groups uh, allow you to... It's a complex scheme because sharing groups uh, is, is, is a pretty large functionality and you have even carrying that kind of information with a different sharing group because it's, it's basically on top of the dis different distribution level. And Sami is currently showing a very nice diagrams with the default uh, um, distribution level. So uh, my organization, this community, connected communities mm -hmm. and all communities and how it's reflect into the sharing group model. Yeah, but I want... I want just to focus on the sharing room part this time, just to explain the difference between the roaming mode and listing instances uh, that that are uh, listed in, on the sharing group. So we have right now the sharing group, the blue sharing group there that has this four organization. And you can see that um, on the gray MISP instance, the one that uh, we are currently on, uh, it, this one has two organizations from that sharing group. So. This one is a local organization, and this one is a local organization. Uh, but the sharing group also has two others, this one and this one. So this one and this one are remote organization. Go back to that remote. 
because they don't have a presence on this gray one. Then, what would be the impact of choosing the roaming mode or to listing this one? If you choose roaming mode, like this, whenever you will synchronize data, MISP will look at the organization that are part of the sharing group, and will look if this organization are present or are owner, let's say, of these MISP instances. So if we check this one and we try to synchronize data under this blue sharing group, then the event will be will, will be synchronized with the red one and the yellow one because there are no restriction and because these organizations are included in the sharing group. Now, if we disable the roaming mode, I only have one, which is a bit of a shame. Um, and we, let's say we've added the red MISP uh, instance in the list of allowed instance, that means that the sharing group, the data under the blue sharing group will only be synchronized with this red instance and not the yellow one, because we haven't listed the yellow one in this list. So I hope it makes sense like this. I think it's having this diagram is very helpful to understand the consequences of using one of these. Uh, if you are not sure to, on what to do, enable it and you are good to go. <laughs> and Last one is the summary and save. So this is like text that explain what you're about to create uh, and uh, what are the consequences uh, of uh, having chosen these, these parameters. So it says that uh, the data that uh, uh, will be under the that sharing group will be visible to this organization, that the sharing group will be synchronized with any interconnected instances link by an eligible organization because we have checked this roaming mode. And if you are good to go, you hit submit and you have your sharing group created. Now, if we go to create an event, we can choose sharing group and then uh, take the sharing group that we just created. I think it was an example sharing group. Yeah. We hit submit. We hit submit. And then you can see the distribution is an example sharing group that we have there. Okay. So do we have any question about the sharing group? I think it's fine. We don't. No. So either nobody understood anything or it's clear. It's clear. <laughs> I'm, I'm betting it's clear. Um, we have a question about decaying models, but I mentioned yes. that... Uh, we can have a look at... During the API, exactly. So. Okay, uh, so let's have a quick look at the uh, diagnostic settings, uh, and then that will be it uh, for uh, demo on the a live instance. So we can access the setting by going into administration, then server settings and maintenance. And then you end up in this home page that will list critical settings, uh, basically settings that requires attention. So you will see that we have a lot of critical settings that's because we are either aggressive uh, on how we consider settings to be critical. Uh, in most of most of the cases, you will have incorrect settings because you haven't confirmed a setting yet. Uh, so let's have a look at an example. We don't have many actually on this one. Uh, but okay, let's have a look at this one, for example, enable or block listing. It is shown as a warning and it says that this setting is set to true. But if you look at the error message that we have there, it says that the value is not set. And we have that warning because we never confirm this setting to be set to true and it's being defaulted to the default value of the setting, which is true. So if you want the setting to go away, we just need to edit that setting that you can do by double clicking on the value and then just pressing this accept button and the warning will go away. And most of the time, these critical warnings are because of that. We have one valid critical warning, which is this one, disable emailing. So on this instance, emailing has been disabled. You can see it says that as an error message. Uh, so that means no outgoing emails will be sent by MISP. Why do we consider it as a critical warning. It is because right now user cannot receive notification whenever an event is published. And 
whenever you create a user account, um, the temporary password will not be sent to that user because uh, it's an encrypted by mail. Uh, and if you cannot send mail, then you cannot send that temporary password. So this is one of the cases why we consider it critical. Okay, so yeah, you've seen that we have a lot of settings. Um, whenever you are running a MISP instance, I think it's a, it's a good thing to, to take 15, 20 minutes to go through all of these settings to really configure your MISP instance. There are really nice settings that will change the behavior of MISP uh, and that will make it a smoother experience. Um, so yeah, I think it's really a, a good time investment and will avoid you some issues later on. So we have general MISP settings, we have encryption settings, we have proxy settings, security settings. I think this one is very important as well. Um, so some uh, settings such as, for example, this one, REST client enable arbitrary URL, they have this CLI only warning, meaning that you cannot change that setting in the user interface. If you want to change it, you have to use the CLI tool uh, on the server. This is mainly for security reason. Uh, so yeah, again, we have lots of uh, security settings. Um, just want to show one that I think is pretty cool. If you want to use, let's say, a poor man OTP, <laughs> you can just enable this one and it will provide OTP out of the box where anytime a user will uh, log in to your instance, a mail will be sent with a temporary password that the user had to have to enter. Uh, yeah, just by enabling these settings, it makes it, uh, it, it enforces this behavior, which I find pretty cool. Uh, then you have the plugin settings. Uh, so we have many plugins. If you remember yesterday, we saw the MIST modules, which offers enrichment possibilities, different imports. Uh, we also have the workflow that we will see later today, the zero MQ that we will see later today, uh, and custom authentication. All of these can be configured in this plugin tab. Uh, and we have a simple background job. If you have uh, migrated your MISP instance to use this new uh, this new service of doing background job, you will be able to configure everything there. Correlation tab allows you to select which correlation engine you want to use. Depending on the type of instance you are in, it, it may be worth to uh, worth to to have a look at this one and change your uh, ACL correlation engine. Uh, Classical example would be if you are on a regular instance, you have partners uh, or you are running a community, then in this case, keep the default correlation engine assist. However, if you are using a MISP instance only uh, on your infrastructure or only your organization have access to it and you don't need to have any SCL uh, uh, or any yeah, SCL checks applied to, to, to your events, then it may be worth to use the no SCL correlation engine because it will speed up uh, the your, your MISP instance quite considerably. And then you have the diagnostic page, uh, which will perform a lot of diagnostic against your MISP instance, for example, version, uh, to check if you are up to date. This is why we can also update your MISP instance by just clicking this update MISP button. You click on it, you wait a few seconds, and then your MISP is up to date. Um, then you have a very interesting one, which is the security audit. So MISP will perform some, say, a security check to see uh, well, how secure your MISP instance is. Uh, so this, these are just uh, warnings, uh, depending on your security. I uh, don't want to say perspective, but... Uh, policies. Policies, thank you very much. Uh, this might be a bit over the top or maybe not enough, uh, but I mean, it's a good indicator on what to, what you have to consider when you're running a MISP instance. Um, just mm -hmm. one thing, uh, because we had a question about 
some libraries missing and so on, especially for sticks. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, mystics is kind of standalone with all the sub modules within mystics. Um, so if you have issue with uh, sticks export and so on, uh, don't check too much the checking, but be sure that the mystics installation is basically the latest one because all the sub modules are part of, of that. Um, so if you, you basically have a uh, mystic, just one thing that may be of importance, a lot of setup of MISC with Python is using a virtual end. So if you install mystics outside the virtual end, MISC doesn't know about it. And you can configure in um, MISC configurations the virtual end uh, parameter or the Python uh, uh, system wide. So you, depending on your installation and what kind of setup you have internally, you can set up the, this um, I think it's in general configuration if I recall correctly. Mm. Um, maybe one last note about that diagnostic page that may be of interest. Um, if you are having some issues where your MISP instance is becoming slow, uh, this might be related to, to this uh, specific setting. So the inner DB buffer pool size. Um, so by default, it is set to a rather low value. And we have provided a recommended value uh, to which you should increase that, uh, that buffer pool size. And really, we've, we've seen dramatic uh, performance improvement by just changing this small uh, database setting. Maybe I can make a side note about performance in this and so on. Oh, yeah. Because uh, for the past 10 years, we, we get a lot of feedback about people having performance. The first thing that you have to check and to really be careful is the kind of sessions handlers that you have in MISP. Uh, by default, if you use a PHP session handler as a file, mm -hmm. It's obviously a main issue because if you start with UAPI and so on, it might be not really uh, efficient. So the recommended setup nowadays, and that's depending of your setup of PHP, so it's session handler, so session underscore handler in the php.ini files, uh, you need to point to the Redis one. So like that, the handler is on Redis uh, directly. It's a good practice, but recently um, we had an instance where it was slow and then they discovered that the file handler was still the default file handlers. Mm -hmm just due to the default configuration of the operating system, so which is variable. So we have no control on that, but performance-wise, uh, it's one first thing to check. And then what Sami was mentioning, MySQL configurations, a lot of setup of uh, MariaDB or MySQL are not fine-tuned at all. And they are really, really basic. Um, so that's something that you can, you can do. Uh, this is an, a question from Andres Chavez, which is a good question about MISP and Elasticsearch, yes, you can do it. Um, there are people that integrate in MISP and Elasticsearch directly. And you have different options to do it. If you want to use Elasticsearch as a backend for storing uh, events and so on, you can use the PubSub channels. Um, Sami will show it uh, quickly today. Um, but in MISP, you can, for example, for any action that is taking place in MISP, you can basically publish it as a JSON. Uh, and they are connector for Elasticsearch. So you can just do it from the OMQ back to Elasticsearch at one point. Then on Elasticsearch itself, you have connector to um, basically interact with the MISP API to search back in Elasticsearch as a CM. So it's another option. So it's depending on what you, you want to do and integrate uh, um, there. But for what Andres is mentioning, it's more like to integrate MISP and Elasticsearch to send the event. So it's more the Pub sub channel uh, connection. There are plenty of connectors for, for that. Uh, we have even an Elasticsearch connector for logs, for auditing, and so on, uh, which is more like related to people using Elasticsearch for um, a log facility. But um, you can really uh, do that uh, in an uh, easy way. But Sami will jump into the zero MQ and uh, pub sub channel just after. Yeah, later on. This is part of the agenda. <clears throat> okay, so I think. I'm almost done. Just the last point that I want to, to bring up is the worker tab. In MISP, we have a lot of, uh, let's say, tasks that are run in the background. Uh, for example, whenever you publish an event, this is handled by a background worker. Whenever you perform an enrichment, this is handled by a background worker. Uh, and synchronization as well. Emailing as well. So a lot of tasks, basically. Uh, and sometimes, uh, it happens that some of these workers are crashing. So it's always a good uh, good thing to go there from time to time to look that uh, everything is working as expected. Um, 
And yeah, so in this interface, you can see that you can view all the workers that are running. You can start new workers if you want to. And you can see also the amount of job or tasks that have been added to this queue. So if you have 1,000 or 2,000 users uh, that needs to be notified by email that a new event has been published, uh, then you will see that uh, this queue uh, sometimes is quite large. Uh, but yeah, at some point it will be consumed. Uh, and if you notice that the queue is too large, you can always start new workers for that. Um, all right. Okay, so now we've seen a lot of basics uh, and administration aspects of MISP. And I think now it's a good time to go over the API section to see how you can automate things and in interact with MISP in a programmatic yeah. way. Maybe just one last question mm -hmm. because oh, yes, the number of ahead. workers. Uh, Carlos uh, Guzman had a question about is there a recommended number of workers and is actually depending of how large is your instance? Mm -hmm. I'll take an example. We, we have an instance where we have like around 4,000 4, users and we send a lot of emails. Oh, so technically for the worker there, I think we are operating like six or seven workers because we send a lot of emails. No, on the other hand, if you have an instance that is sending like one email to one user, you don't need a lot of worker. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, it's maybe a wild guess, but it's really depending of, of the use case. Um, there's a cache, a default, the email one, and so on. Uh, it's really depending on what you're actually doing. Obviously, the update one, this one is a single one for, for the update and so on. But the email is usually the one that you want to extend if you want to send a lot of emails um, or even default, uh, depend, mm -hmm. depending on your use case. But um, I would say there's not kind of standard answer. It's, it's really depending of how large in the instance and how many things are, are basically running in backgrounds. Yeah. So for me, as a rule of thumb, uh, and this is without any argument, let's say, uh, having twice the amount of workers than the number of CPU that you have, that's what I'm usually doing. But I mean, I don't have concrete argument to back up that uh, uh, that uh, decision that I just uh, took. Well, but yeah, there are many things to consider and mainly how the instance uh, is being used. Okay, so now API. Hold on, this can go away. This can go away. Okay. So for this one, I will be using my development instance that it's a bit faster. So it has a lot of junk data there. Oh, let me do it again, again. And I have debug enabled, so don't worry too much about that. Okay, and I also have prepared a Jupyter notebook. There we go. So on the agenda, we have two, let's say, section on the API. We have the MISP REST API. This is the API that you will use if you want to like perform simple HTTP requests by using, for example, curl or uh, any other libraries that uh, is able to send uh, HTTP requests from any programming language. And the second section is PyMISP. So we have a Python wrapper uh, around the MISP API that, we, that is in Python. Uh, and that handles a lot of different things that you would have to do manually if you were not using this uh, library. But we'll see both uh, cases starting by the REST API. Whoops. Is this the correct one? Yes. Okay, I will give you the link as well. So I'm sure Alex already pasted the, the, the link the, yeah, on the, the this string, but I want I will just paste the one that I'm currently using. So if you if you want to um, to run it uh, later on, you can always do it. Yeah, so there are, I'm not misleading, I think there are three Jupyter notebooks um, in the uh, MIS training. So the one that Sam is mentioning is the one that he will use uh, during the session mm -hmm. today. But in the PyMISP uh, directory, I will, I will share it uh, with you. Uh, there are um, three Jupyter notebooks, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
with different approach, one for the search, which one which is more global on the different one. And this one is a kind of quick introduction to uh, nearly, cover, nearly cover everything. So um, the nice thing with Jupyter Notebook, it's you can run it against Animus instances. So if you have a test instance or a VM or something like that, just fire Jupyter, and then you can connect and just play with the different. Okay, thanks. Uh, so yeah, send me, yeah you, you, it's next to you, so that's great. Uh, so the, there's plenty of Pymist Notebook, uh, how to use it and so on. And someone, and going back to the question that we had earlier about um, um, the uh, timestamp search that we have on the filtering on the uh, remote servers, mm -hmm. there are a lot of examples with timestamp. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and those filters can really apply there. So it's not only for the one using the API, it might be useful for the one setting, setting up uh, synchronization with other instances because it's exactly the same kind of rule that you can apply. Okay, so I was planning to show three Jupyter Notebook, two related to the uh, MISPRESS API and one for PyMISP. Uh, so the first one, I've pasted it in the chat, but if you go back one one folder on GitHub, you will also see the, um, the query MISP uh, Jupyter Notebook. So the first one is about general APIs, uh, endpoint that you have and how to use them. The second notebook is about queries, uh, parameters, uh, and some some examples on the type of query that you can use to extract data from MISP. And the last Jupyter notebook that we will see today is uh, by using PyMISP, where we will see how you can create data offline and then upload it on the MISP instance, but also how to do searches on the MISP instance using PyMISP. Uh, so yeah. In some of the, the points, I will quickly go over them because it's quite repetitive. And to be honest, if you want more information, you always have, always have the open API specification. Okay, so this might be a little bit counterintuitive um, because right now uh, you are looking at Python codes, but that's because I'm executing the request using Python so that I can parse the result and, and show some summaries in some cases in the interface, but what it's actually doing is basically just curl uh, call, let's say. We'll just run this one. There we go. Okay, so First, what do we what do we need? Well, to interact with the API, you first need to have an API key, right? So you can get your API key if you go to global action, then my profile. Then you can click on auth keys. Um, and then you can click on add authentication key. Uh, then you can provide a comment uh, that will be attached to this authorization key, authorization key. So for example. Uh, key use. You can also provide which IPs are allowed to use this API key for security purposes. If if you want, you can always do it. You can also set an expiration. Then you click submit, and the API key is provided on the screen. Uh, copy it now because it's the only time this will be shown. Once you are good to go, you click on I have noted the key. Um, and then you cannot recover the key anymore because this has been hashed in the database. So now that we have our API key, uh, I've added it there. And uh, you have to like specify which URL your MISP instance is hosted at. And then I have disabled some warnings and created a function to show some summaries. And then let's go actually to the usage of the API. So right now we are looking at the event add endpoint. This is the endpoint to obviously create event on your MISP instance. So whenever you're creating events, you can see that you can provide multiple parameters. You can provide date, distribution, thread level, analysis, and the event info. Uh, the only uh, 
field that is actually required is the event info. Um, the others will be defaulted to the value that you have set up in the settings. So in this case, I have created this one, event created via the APIs example, uh, took the, the trade level ID to be one and the distribution to be zero, zero being this your organization only. So let's go to our list of events. And we can see that uh, I have run it earlier today. So let's quickly delete it so that I'm not cheating. And then let's run this comment. So now I can see when you run this API call, MISP will return uh, well, a blob of the event that was created. And if you go back to the interface, you can see that we created this event and we actually have event created via the API as an example with the correct distribution set. I can view this event. I can see that the event ID is 80 and I can find it back there. This is one of the reasons why also MISP returns you what was created so that you can then from that point on continue interacting with MISP without having to query back your MISP instance. So the ID and the UID are very useful in this case. Something to keep in mind is um, MISP is quite, I would say, uh, lax and flexible. When you create such kind of event, we, you just set up the, the minimal field that are required. Mm -hmm. And you see in the example of Sunny, it's, it's quite like, I think, like several fields. Um, and then at the end, basically, MISP is setting up the additional UID, the affiliation organization, and so on, and you get back the information. So keep that in mind. Just set up, if you have an error so when creating events or things like that, just look at the minimal field and then go further later on if you are missing something. Yeah. Um, so next point is to edit an event, so to change something. So in this case, I'm just path passing a different distribution level. So setting the distribution level to be three. So if I run this one, I get an event uh, was returned and I can see the distribution has been set to three. And if I go back to my MISP instance, and I re reload, you can see that the distribution has been changed as expected. So, uh, yeah, this one is a bit cheating, so I will skip for now, but I will come back to it later on. Um, what else can we do? Well, we can also add tags to data that we created. So in this case, uh, I'm using the endpoint tags attached tags to object. Object being a bit misleading because we are not talking about a MISP object. It's about an object in MISP, like an entity. Uh, so it can be attribute, it can be an event. So I've provided the UID of the event that I've collected from this interface. And then I can provide the tag that I want to attach. So if I run it, it says global tags is fully attached to the event. And if I reload, I can see the tag was created. Uh, what else do we have? In this case, um, I'm searching for event on the index. So these are the, the different parameters that we've already uh, pasted, pasted in the chat several times. Uh, you can find all of them uh, on the open API specification, same for all the different parameters that we've been using so far. So in this case, publish timestamp, let's take the timestamp uh, of today. Three, nine, six. Ah, we don't have anything. Why? Because the event is not published. And I cannot publish it because I don't have any attributes. So we'll come back to this one later on. Uh, so this is also to do searches. Don't have anything right now. So let's see how you can create attributes. So in our case, the event ID that we have is 80. Okay. And then if I want to create an attribute to that event, I can use the attributes add. And then I have to provide the ID of the event to which I want to create an attribute. That's what I'm doing there. And then I can pass uh, well, the attribute that I want to create. So if we go back to the creation interface, the only two fields that are actually required when you are trying to create an attribute or the type of the attribute and the value. The others can be defaulted to some uh, fallback values. 
So in our case, I'm setting the attribute to be of type IP destination and the value to be 8889. So if I run it, it returns me the attribute that was created with the UID. And if we go back to our event, then now we can see our newly created attribute. So let's have a look at what happens if we try to create an attribute uh, value that does, does not validate the type. So if I'm choosing the MD5 type, attribute type, obviously this the value must be a valid MD5 file hash. Um, so not file hash, sorry, MD5 hash. Uh, and in this case, it's clearly not the case. So if I try to run it, you can see that I got an error and it explained me what, what, what went wrong. What I can also do is edit attributes. So I will grab the ID of that specific attribute. And in this case, we have created the attribute with the value 8889. And what I will try to do is to change it to this value, but also turn off the IDS flag by setting two IDS zero and add a comment. If I run this one and get the attribute back and we can check in this, uh, this result that the RTS flag has been turned off, that we have added the comment and that the value has been changed. And if you go back to this, to MISP and we read out, you can see that it matches what we just did. Um, this one is a bit advanced, uh, so I will just skip it. But so let's have a look at object now. So you can also create object using the API. And I think this is one of the reasons why people prefer to use PyMisp instead of using the whole API of MISP, because there is like a lot of things to, to do, especially when you're dealing with object. So you have to first pick an object, the correct name of the object, the correct template of the object, the correct version of the object. So it's really annoying uh, to do manually. Yeah, yeah. Just, just a reminder, yeah. it's in this case, Sami is showing you the usage of Python with a direct call, so mm -hmm. meaning that it's a direct API access, just like if you are using curl, for example, yeah. to use uh, to use a MISP API. On this one, like you mentioned, PyMISP has a Python-esque way of using it. Uh, to go a bit further, and mm -hmm. that for creating objects and so on, there are plenty of, yeah. of nice features to to make it easier for the two D operations. And I just had time to read quickly the chat, and I see I see that there is a question uh, to have function to create to add an event right away in the uh, in MISP, and yes, there is one in PyMISP, uh, and we will see that in a minute. Well, after this, the the query MISP notebook. Um, all right, so let's let's see what happens if we try to run this one. We got the object back. I think yeah. the question was related to the API access. Mm -hmm. It's more like should allow to allow it to limit the endpoints. Oh, yeah. no. So that's why I answer that there is no really API endpoint function for filtering. Nevertheless, some role have limited API access for some part. Like for example, the tiger rules, you can attack if you mm -hmm. you cannot basically uh, have this uh, role. Um, so I'm sure for Jorge, if you have uh, you want to refine your question in the chat, feel free. Uh, because even both of us have different understanding yeah, of the okay. questions. Uh, so, uh... okay. So now see that we have created this wonderful object. Yeah, there is a question about from Sam is there any limit in the number of tags while using uh, Miss Search? Also, can you show some sample of this big complex query? We'll go that later on. but. Uh, no, there's no limit as far as I know. Well, the post limit. Post limit. Uh, well, yeah, the, the post body. Just limit. be careful with something. If you have like a uh, hundred of tags and so on, performance wise, maybe not the most mm -hmm. things to do. But no, there's no direct limits, but you might face a uh, limitation or at least some performance problem if you really have like hundred of tags. Okay, it's a second. So that means you mean. Okay, so that means you mean uh, an easier way to add event and so on. That's, that's for sure. That's a thing that we will uh, just uh, 
in the minute. <laughs> the second, which is the uh, one with is the holes. No, the ah okay, the the pie is stuff. All right, I suppose so. Yeah, but you have two, the two answers, so now you can <laughs> do whatever you like with it. That's right. Yeah, and for the build complex complex query, this is pie is predated, so. We'll see that when we go over the pines. Uh, it, it was to allow the API not to use all the functions. So, okay, that was the uh, interpretation. Yeah, okay. Okay, so going back to that, I see an option so if you want to limit and so on. Um, you can play with reverse proxy too. Mm -hmm. Because those have endpoints mm -hmm. um, and you can really restrict those. So, there is no direct way you miss to do it. If the role is not sufficient, then you can do a reverse proxy with just having access to. I know, add events, for example. That would work. But I would be curious in which scenario this would be useful to only add event. Yeah, I'm, because I'm we have to... we have the read only permission that allows only people to read to data read. Exactly. without creating it. Uh, but I would be curious to we see have some restrictions on tagging elements and mm -hmm. so on, or creating new tags. Yeah. Um. So it's it's a good question. Maybe it's a specific use case that we don't know about. No, maybe uh, if it's a custom application to have uh, additional limitations on them before mm -hmm. actually querying the uh, NISP API. I would be curious too. Yeah, but so, if you want to go further, uh, Jorge, don't hesitate to open an issue on, on, on GitHub, mm -hmm. uh, GitHub slash NISP slash NISP, and we can have a look at it. Okay, so let's proceed. So whenever you are Whenever you want to export data or to serve for data in MISP, by data I mean events, attribute, and object, um, the best is to use the research action. Uh, as it says on the on the notebook, this is the most powerful search tool in MISP. So you can either search on the attribute scope or you can search on the event scope that is there. And we will start with the attributes. Um, so once again, all the parameters are described and explained in the Open API specification. Uh, so what we can do is to search uh, and provide the event ID. This is just to show you uh, uh, an example on how to use that, that endpoint. Uh, because this one, we are just collecting all attribute from the event that we created. So the this one. So in this case, we have two attributes, this one and this one. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we see count two, and then we have the first attribute with that value and the second attribute with that value, value post that we have. Yeah, so let's see what else we can do. Uh, just oh. just, just mm -hmm. one logistical question. I have a private question about any break soon. Uh, oh, we can do a five-minute break. We can do a five-minute break. On the other end, if uh, Sammy and I, we feel confident to just go to the five o'clock, things, it's pretty be recorded. You can see it back if you want. So that's it. Um, I mean, it's up to you. You can choose. I'm fine too. So you can continue and go on. All right. So uh, it's for the one that sent me the questions, it will be recorded, so don't hesitate to mm. move away from your computer. Yeah, and check it back later on. <laughs> and check it back later on, so no worries. Yeah. All right. Um, so what else can we use to filter data? Um, so in this case, I'm restricting uh, on this event uh, specifically so that I don't have a bunch of uh, other results polluting the, the interface, uh, the, the notebook there. Uh, so we can search based on the type of the attribute. So if I want to export all attributes that are of the type IP destination. That's what I have there. I will just comment this one for a sec. I run it and see I have count one. You can also search on the value. So in this case, we are searching for all attributes of type IP destination that start with one, two, three. We don't have any, so we have no attribute. But if I were to do like one, two, seven, zero, and then like this, then we have one because this attribute starts with uh, 127.0. And then this is the wildcard operator. 
uh, you can use a wildcard operator for the value, for the type, for tag, and so on, as you will see later on. Now, in some cases, you can delete attributes. So let's oh, invalid template, okay. So let's create um, a fake attribute. All right, let's publish the event quickly. And let's delete one, let's say this one. So when you delete an event, uh, an attribute, it's not really deleted. It's actually what we call soft deleted. So we just have a flag that marks this attribute as deleted. The reason why we do that is to be able to revoke an attribute on remote instances. Um, all right, so if you want to check all attributes that have been deleted, you just need to click this deleted button. Uh, oh, actually I have R deleted that one. <laughs> That's not good. Uh, so then I can do that. There we go. So I have it uh, soft deleted now. Um, and when you are using the API, you can specify the state of the deleted flag. So if you were to use zero, that would mean that you want to have attributes that are not deleted. So in this case, we have the post, this one that is not deleted. You could say that you want to have attributes that are deleted. And then we have uh, this one. And you can use uh, an array to provide the two value. Uh, this uh, syntax is actually similar to this one, so it's an OR. So in this case, we would find all attributes that are not deleted and that are deleted. And if you run it, now we have two attributes. Okay, then one of the most used feature to filter uh, things in this is by using tags. So we can do there is various way on how you can uh, use this one. So we can do searches on like a simple tag name. We don't have any, so let's add one quickly. What is that? No. I have to restore it. Yes. And let's add, uh, what was it again? CLP white. You're not really compliant with the new CLP regulations. Uh, this is this is an old notebook. Ah, okay, that's fine. So now we have our wonderful attribute. You can also ask MISP to get all attributes that are either marked as TLP white and TLP green. So let's add TLP green for this one. So that we have it also included in the response. So you can see now we have the two attributes. You can also ask MISP to return all attributes that don't have the TLP green attached. Uh, so by don't, I mean not having the TLP green and to express the, this negation part, you just put an exclamation mark in front of the, of the tag name. So if I run that, the one that read that doesn't have the TLP green tag is actually this one that has the TLP white. Uh, interestingly enough, I don't have anything to, what to, ah, because I have TLP green on the top. Let's remove it quickly so that we have the expected result. There we go. Yeah. That was a good example. Of inheritance, yes, exactly. <laughs> this is a, a nice side effect um, showing that attributes inherit tags of their event. So if you attach a TLP classification on the event, all the attributes will inherit that tag. Um, so it's actually the way you should do it. If you have an event with IOCs, you attach uh, these kind of tags on the event so that you don't have to duplicate this information on all attributes. Uh, but yeah, that was a nice one uh, to show. And again, it's going back to the performance and the limit of tags. Mm -hmm. If you know that the information and label uh, for all the attributes and events, uh, all attributes and objects and so on, just set up at the event level, that would be easier. And that's handled by the API automatically. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to add all those tags to all the attributes. Okay. You can also use wildcards and you can use composition with and and not. So in this case, we would do a search and get all attributes that have the TLP green tag and the malware tag attached, but don't have the ransomware, well, any tag that contain ransomware in its name. Uh, so we can do like stuff like this. Uh, another aspect is the pagination. 
So when you export data, um, depending on the filtering, you might export a lot of data. So in some instances, we have instances that have like 15 millions of attributes. Um, if you try to like export all attributes that are marked with TLP green, uh, you might have like, I don't know, 5 million attributes that you will try to um, ask MISP to, to export. Uh, this is not gonna, going to work, obviously. This is way too, too much data. So what you have to do in this case is to paginate. So you can provide, for example, a limit of, I don't know, 1,000 or even 10,000. I think that would be fine for attributes. And then you go from page to page. So in our case, just to show an example, I will ask the first attribute of the event. So you can see we have this one. And then I can increment the page and get the second one. So usually you would put a higher number, like 1,000 or 10,000, depending on what you're trying to export. And then you paginate until you exhaust everything. So if I go to page three, now I don't have anything because I only have two attributes. So I think the yeah. recommendations is to paginate by default. Yeah. Because you, 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 you never know which kind of instance you have on the other hand. Uh, you don't know the data that are behind and so on. So paginate and you always save you uh, handling of 500 because of timeout, things like that, because the uh, uh, result is not still on your client side. So um, paginate in all the cases, that's usually easier. Yeah, you have some precision as well regarding uh, filtering about timestamp. Um, we have three types of parameters. We have published timestamp, just timestamp, and even timestamp. And they all mean something different. So published timestamp is the timestamp at which the event was published, was last published. So in this case, it's this time. Timestamp is the time at which the data was last modified. So in this case, it is, um, it is not fully shown, but it is this time. Because I've published the event, but then I change a few stuff. Like uh, if I uh, toggle this ideas flag, this uh, this attribute has been updated, and this the timestamp of this attribute is higher than the timestamp of the last publishing. So it's depending on what you want to to export, makes sense we use either the publish or the timestamp. I would say if you want to export data for to be fed to your productive tool tools, use the publish timestamp. And the event timestamp is only accessible on the attribute scope is if you want to uh, get attributes, uh, but instead of using the timestamp of, of the attribute, use the timestamp of the event because events have a timestamp and a, a published timestamp. The reason behind, and just one example, mm -hmm. you might have, for example, uh, uh, an event that is quite old, but it, which is regularly updated. And you sometimes doesn't want to uh, feed your systems with such kind of event, which is kind of, you know, old, still expired, but still there. So on addition there, so you will use even uh, timestamp there. So previously, we had a question about enforcing warning list. And yes. it's, it's good because that's what we are going to see right now. Uh, so I will just comment out this one and provide the correct this. This. There we go. Uh, so now I have all my attributes, but you can see that we have a potential false positive uh, because this attribute is tripping over a warning list, uh, tripping over the warning list of known IPv4 public DNS resolver. And you can see we have a small notification there. Uh, the enrichment is a bit annoying in this case, uh, but yeah, so we have it. And what you can do by using the enforce warning list parameter is to ask MISP to filter out any attributes that are tripping over warning list. So we had two without it. Now if you run it, we only have one and which is the one that do not have a warning. If we disable the IDS flag, we don't have the warning anymore. And we have, we should have both attributes. Mm -hmm. Just don't forget. Oh, oh I know. No, no, my instance is badly configured yeah. because this one is enforced on all. Yeah. yeah. Just, just one thing regarding warning list. Don't forget to enable uh, the warning list uh, because by default, warning lists are not enabled. So it's, it's what you, you can select. Uh, mm. 
I may have messed up with my settings there, but this is my dev, dev instance, so I'm not that worried. Yeah. I, I touched that uh, a bit. Maybe if you working. go to the uh, input filter to just so ah, yeah. where to enable good, the warning list. Good point. Um, so you basically have an index with a warning list, and you see on this instance, uh, some are enabled, uh, not that much, I think. Uh, yeah, just two, which are the DNS resolver. Uh, but so you can say, select which one to apply. Mm -hmm. um, it's really depending on the use case. Um, so I would say if you are strictly feeding system and so on, usually you want to enable as maximum as you as you can a warning list. If it's just for some analysts and so on, sometimes you just want to have a selection out of this. Um, and you can even uh, add manually warning list into the systems. Um, so it could be, for example, custom warning list for uh, IP infrastructure in your networks or your sandbox, for example, IP addresses. Yeah, it's pretty cool to add warning lists. If you know about your infrastructure, you can also prevent uh, uh, and have warnings in the user interface that uh, you've entered details about your infrastructure. We have a question in the chat. I will, I will just repeat the question just uh, to have it in the recording. Is it possible via the API to add an attribute on object like IP or domain and in the same time execute enrichment on the same attribute object and add mm -hmm. all those details to the event? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the answer is yes. Yes, in multiple uh, steps. Uh, well, yeah, you can do it via the API, but there is actually a better way to do it. And that's why we are a bit speeding, speeding up. Um, it's by using workflows immediately. So in this, you can create workflows that executes automatically when something happened in your MISP instance. And one of these execution can lead to automatic enrichment of attributes. That's why we are speeding up a bit because we have one hour remaining and yeah. So, so the automation over. aspect, what we 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 show right now is the API usage mm -hmm. um, through uh, through BIMISP. but then a lot of 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 basically activities like uh, automatic enrichment and so on can be done without using the API by just using the workflow. Yeah. So we mentioned that we can that MISP can export data under multiple formats. So in this case, I'm using the RPZ export format. I don't have much, uh, but you could also export it as CSV. And the way to do it is just to supply return format, and then you provide the return format you want the data to be exported in. Um, so the list of uh, supported return format is, again, on the Open API specification. Uh, let's see if we have anything relevant. Adding sightings. I don't remember if we show how to add sightings uh, yesterday. I think so. Uh, but anyway, it, it's not something that you usually do manually. Uh, if you want to add sightings and say that you've seen that IOC, you would do it via the API. And that's the way to do it. So you go use the sighting add endpoint. You add the value that you that your seam or I guess so, so. And then the sighting will be attached automatically. Um, yeah, you can. This one I can skip. You can also manage your instance with the API. For example, in this one, we are creating a new organization. With this one, we are creating a new user. You can create sharing groups and so on. Uh, but yeah, this yeah. is nothing like. There were questions about uh, using API for um, integration with um, notification system or EIM systems. Mm -hmm. You can use those endpoints through your IAM, for example, to automatically create uh, sharing groups and stuff like that. Uh, so we know some users that have customized their uh, notifications uh, server to integrate with the MISP API to uh, create sharing groups, create users, uh, change passwords, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's nothing that complex. I mean, just, just have a look at the Open API specification, and you will see that it's mostly makes sense. I mean, if you want to create an organization, go on organization slash add. If you want to add a server, go to server slash add. If you want to create a sharing group, go to sharing group slash add, and then provide the information. OK, so next notebook. I don't think it's this is, I'm a bit confused. This is not the one I wanted to show first. This is the one, I think. OK, now, now it's about uh, PyMISP. But before jumping to PyMISP, one last thing that I want to mention. Uh, in the MISP uh, user interface, you can have access to the Open API specification, but also to have access to the built-in REST client. 
um, you can view it as a playground on which you can try out different queries. So if you want to, I don't know, do a rest search of attributes, you can select the rest search template, then you have some information about the different parameters supported. Uh, you can enter your API key and then enter anything that is uh, relevant uh, for filtering, and then you can run the query. Uh, just example before that. Then event ID, this was OT. And then uh, written format, let's say, for example, JSON. So this interface is a really nice way to build and, uh, your own queries and to make some, some tests and so on. Um, and you see that the view have directly the output there uh, on the UI. And you can even just get the code, corresponding code in curl or in PyMIS. Oh, the exact so I do that again, open it right away, and it's campaigning because uh, this, is, yes. this is a cell, exactly. Yeah. So you see, it's, it's super handy. I mean, you, you have to write some script. You don't exactly know to write your uh, your query and so on. This tool is helping you to design it, especially that you have autocomplete on the format in the HTTP poly and so on. So it's, it's really, uh, really interesting. <laughs> yeah, there. and the questions from the return format can be changed to the other format, obviously. Um, so you have return format JSON, you can put CSV, for example, and you just have to put it CSV. Uh, yes, and all those formats. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. If you also have a query history, you can also bookmark your queries. But if you want to, to use a different return format, you can just change it there. And you have a different format available for, for this. Yeah. So even format are different on rest search for uh, attributes or events, but that's uh, there is and depending on the format that's supported. You have mm -hmm. plenty of different formats there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go back to PyMisp. Oh, I feel like I'm jumping left and right. <laughs> um okay, so this one, this one seems to be working. That's perfect. Okay, so in PyMisp you you can create entities by using the different uh, abstracted, uh, let's say, data structure that we have in MISP. For example, if you want to create an event, you can just call this uh, object to create a new empty object by using the MISP event. Then you can assign the different properties of that object, for example, creating uh, the event title, the different distribution analysis, <clears throat> and trend level. And then if you call the to JSON on that uh, MISP event object, then you have the JSON representation of that uh, MISP event. Now, it should be noted that we are just creating this in memory, like in the Python execution context. Nothing has been pushed to MISP. MISP doesn't know about this event. If I go back to my MISP instance and I try to reload this page, obviously I don't have this event created because it's just an object that is created in the in the script. If I want to have it in MISP, I need to use uh, the PyMISP uh, MISP client to send this event. And we'll see that at the end of the notebook. But basically, you can interact with these objects and create fully fledged event. Uh, there is a good question. So was the SQL debugger on MISP instance with Sandish um, seems a good way to understand how to use the data interface with MISP? Uh, so it's it's just a debug mode on uh, on. I mean this one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's because I have debug enabled. You have just a debug enabled, so you can just like go there and and, and look at it. So. So I have debug and SQL dump as well. Very useful to analyze why queries takes a lot of time. Yeah, for debugging and so on, it's it's, it's one way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the questions. So it's, <laughs> it's good, good questions. But please don't enable this if you have misp running in production. Exactly, yeah. You you might leak some data that mm -hmm. you don't want to, to mm -hmm. share with other users. Mm -hmm. We've seen that. Um, don't tell all the details. Um, yeah, okay. So we have our event. Uh, we can also add a tag by just calling the, the add tag uh, function on the event. So we can see now we have the tag TLP white that has been added. 
you can modify by setting the date. So we can see there are various way on how uh, the PyMIS handle the dates. So you can just provide a string. You can provide a weird date format supported by how Python date parsing work. Uh, you can also use daytime library. So you can do today, set the date to, to the daytime object. Uh, so yeah, you can do various things and they all will work seamlessly. Uh, you can also obviously add attribute to event. So in this case, we are using the add attribute function that is available on the event object to add an attribute of the type IP destination and then the value. And if you want to provide additional information such as the category, the idea, the distribution, and so on, you can always do it. You know, we can see the type of the attribute is a by misp, misp attribute. And if we dump the content of this attribute to JSON, we can see that we created an attribute of type IP destination and the category and IDS flag was automatically set based on the defaults. <laughs> and the UID was even generated automatically. These are the kind of things that uh, is not that has that you have to do manually if you are not using PyMIS. Yeah, so PyMIS try to be clever and mm -hmm. you don't have to be worried about okay, what kind of default field I have, I have to put and so on. It's basically PyMIS is doing it for you. Yeah, so we can add a second attribute or we'll call attributes second that we store the result in this uh, variable. Uh, we can modify an existing attribute by just changing the property, like doing a new assignment. Uh, we can also add a tag. So two ways to do it. Either you you go back to, to the event object, you access the list of attributes, then you take the first attribute of that list, and then we add the tag. Or you can directly use the variable that was assigned there when you use the add attribute function. Both of them work. And then we can dump the content of the of the event. Not really readable. Let's see if we do this. Oh, it's not better. Let's do this. It's slightly better. But it's shown as misattributed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you would you would find the tag on for the first attribute and the tag for the second attribute in the list. You can do deletion, you can mark an event as being published. Um, instead of using these add attribute function, you can create an attribute similar to the way we created an event by using the misp attribute object constructor. Um, so we use it directly. So we have a misp attribute object. You can also load data from JSON directly. So this is a valid JSON string, and you can create an empty attribute and load its data from the JSON by using the from JSON function. Um, yeah, so you can also create objects and you will see the, how easy it is to do in PyMISC uh, compared to what you would have to do by using the raw API. So in this case, we are adding an attribute, nothing fancy. These lines create a MISP object. Uh, so we create an object of type domain IP and we provide some default attribute parameters uh, like this one that we created just above. Then we can assign a comment to this object. Uh, this line creates another attribute that we add to the object. So see, this object is this object there. And by calling the same function that we used on the event, we can add it in, inside the object. We can also tag the attribute and add more attribute to that object. And finally, we can add this object to the event. And this is what we have at the end. Uh, unfortunately, it's not well sh not shown if I would want it to be shown. Um, so but if you want to, maybe you do a JSON dumps uh, of the output dumps with an S. So you, in the JSON object, mm -hmm. you you basically the value of the JSON you do a JSON dot dumps uh, of the object, and as a uh, parameter indent equal to like this. Yes, with a dumps. Yeah, yeah. and then. And then indent to, yeah, and I guess I need to do this. Uh, first. Yeah, first we convert oh. as a oh. JSON attribute. To the... uh, maybe I have a JSON declare somewhere. No, no, it's, it's just that uh, even itself should already be a JSON. So you need to call to JSON first. Yes, exactly. But yeah, 
Mysterious, because, because Jason has been declared the boss. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's what I meant. See. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, and anyway. Next time. I mean, you have to trust me, and if you don't trust me, I mean, feel free to pass the, that one out. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and I run it already twice, so we have quite of uh, duplication of data, which is not ideal. Uh, but anyway, so what else do we have? Short version to add an object to this event. Uh, you can use directly the add object. And then when you have this object, you can add all the attributes. Uh, maybe just one side note. Mm -hmm. What we are doing right now is we are not interacting with MISP itself. Yeah. We are really, really doing it on, on the uh, core format of MISP, uh, which is very handy because you can do a lot of things without zero interaction with the MISP server. It's just like preparing something that you mm -hmm. can submit. So you see, I don't have anything pushed uh, or added to my MISP instance yet. Um, okay, let's, let's run this one. It's becoming to be a large event. But imagine if we were to do, each time we want to create an attribute, if you were to do request, there would be so many back and forth uh, that it would be like hard for me to, to keep up and the system would be really slow. So by using this, building your data in memory in Python, and then when you are done pushing it to MISP, you really speed up that process. I can set first in last ins. Uh, we have some helpers to create object even faster, for example, to create a uh, fully featured object from CSV, to create uh, object from files and so on. A lot of cool stuff that I will not really show, but if you're interested, feel free to check out this, uh, these uh, cells in the notebook. And do we have anything worth mentioning again? Yeah, just one point uh, Amirul is asking about mm -hmm. um, the full overview. I, Python, there's a common asking for URLs and API key. Do I need to use the Python code or just want to run it? So you can run it directly in uh, Jupyter. So it's, it's physically, you would have to install Jupyter, mm -hmm. uh, which will run the Python code. And the URL and API that you will use is basically the MIS that is reachable from your computers running the Jupyter notebook. That could be the training instance that we have right now. Or it could be another instance that you have on your VM or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So now we've seen how we can build data in memory in PyMISP. And now let's see how you can interact with MISP using PyMISP. So in this, this one, I'm creating an event and I'm loading the content of that event from a file on the disk. So we can see that I have uh, one attribute, I have some tags, and this is the uh, complete JSON of one of these attributes. Um, I could I could change, I could add tags from, from that newly created event in memory. I could change uh, the creator of that event, but what I'm currently interested in, interested in is to push it to my MISP instance. So to be able to interact with MISP using PyMISP, you need first to provide the URL of the MISP instance you want to interact with, and you need to provide the authorization key. So that's what I'm doing there. And then I will create, well, initialize a Python, a PyMISP client by using PyMISP there, where I provide the URL, the API key. And in this case, I'm not verifying certificate because I have a self-signed certificate for my development instance. And then what do we have there? Ooh, a lot of stuff going on. So I'm creating an event, assigning some meta information, creating a file object, adding a file name to that file object, adding that object to the event. And then this call, MISP, which is the, the client to interact with MISP, dot add event, will create that event on MISP. Then we print the content. Actually, let's, let's do it in two steps. So let's just stop there and let's see what happens. So I have my MISP event there. And if I go in MISP and I refresh, I can see that I have a new event. So we have, this is my new MISP event. And let's see if we have a file and we do have a file with the file name and the TLP ember tag. So we have the file, the file name and the TLP ember tag. So let's see how easy it is to create a, a, an attribute with the tag belonging to a, an object. And just this call, push it to MISP. What else do we have after? 
after we create uh, another file object. Okay, let's do this. Let's do it like this, comment this out. So we create a new object, we add a new attribute to that object, we add that object to the existing event, and then we update this event. So let's see what happened. You can see that now we have the new object with still P white. And by just calling this update event and passing passing the uh, event to be uploaded on this, it works. Um, so you are not forced to create an event like this using this basic event. You can immediately use the add event call. So this may be the answer to one of the questions that were asked previously in the chat, how to quickly create an event using the PyMIS uh, API. Well, just initialize the client and then create the add event function, uh, well, call the add event function with the parameters and you would have it right away. Uh, right away. But see now we have the event ID 82. And if I go back to the list of events, we have the event from the book with the ID 82. Just one thing that we mm -hmm. had a question about. Someone is mentioning the old download API, uh, which is giving some more information on research. Um, technically, the download API is completely deprecated. This one is, is obviously something that will completely disappear very soon. Um, so we usually ask to use rest search. Um, if the results are different, is is uh, most probably due to the rest search query that you are doing. Uh, but the backend system is exactly the same, so you you should have exactly the same uh, same data as output. Hmm. This is weird, but yeah, maybe there is something related to like uh, the search, yeah, itself. the search, yeah. the publish stage of the event. And the download has no pagination. So for very large data set, it, it, it's basically a broken API. Mm -hmm. We still have it because very old tools are still using it. But really, we we, uh, we really advise to not use uh, the slash download interface for... This one has been deprecated for more than five years now or six years. So you should really not use it. So now we can also get events that are on MISP and load it locally. You can do it by just calling the get event and providing the uh, event ID. Um, and then you can do modification on this event. And once you are done, you can call the update event uh, to push the change on the MISP instance. And I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. And you can also add, do the administration stuff using PyMISP. Just have a look at the uh, the documentation. And despite the time, since we had a question about build complex query, I will just try to see if we have an example there. And if we don't, I can show an example. So yeah, maybe one thing, if you want to use the rest search, uh, uh, but this time using PyMISP instead of the rest uh, classical HTTP, uh, API, you have to use MISP, which is the, the, the client dot search, which is for a handle for uh, an alias for a search. Then you can choose if you want to do the search against the event or the attribute, and then you can pass any search parameter that you want, such as value, the type, the different tags, and so on. And it seems I don't see complex. Oh, there we go. We have a, we have some there. Uh, so, yeah, you can build a complex query like this, the OR parameters, the two tags, and then you can pass a complex query um, like, like shown on screen. So you can do it for tags. You can also do it uh, uh, for value. Mm -hmm. So you would be also able to do complex query and then like value one, value two, and instead of tags, you would put value there and pass the complex query object. And that should work. Yeah. You can also ask for CSV. This is pretty standard. Yeah, the Jupyter notebooks is a good example of what you can do. And uh, uh, they're regularly updated. So you might see new queries and new things uh, popping up. 
Um, we have a question regarding the decaying of indicators, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure if you want to go in that direction first, or maybe workflow first. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I will go. I will explain decaying in one minute. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that that's gonna be fast. So but it's not the trailing; it's a channel. It's at all. So, so you you mentioned that we have the Jupiter having a lot of example, but if you go on PyMisp, uh, PyMisp repository, we also have a folder called examples, and then sure. there you have a lot of example, like how to add generic object, how to add a name attribute, how to add an organization. Yeah. It's a, it's like a buffet of example. Okay, so decaying of indicators in one minute. Just explain the concept. So in MISP, um, do we have some enabled? We do. Awesome. So if you click on this decay score, if you have some decaying uh, models enabled, you will have this new column that appear that will show you um, the model and the score coming. Well, that has been computed using that model. So how does it work? In MISP, you can create models that can be applied when you use this interface, but mainly when you use the API. And you can request MISP to filter IOCs that are above a specific threshold. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, we have the value, which is 71. And you could ask MISP to filter any IOCs that are above the threshold 70. If it's above, it will be included in the export. If it's not, it will not be included. Now we'll show in one second the interface. So it's in, uh, I believe it was in administration and it's global. It's global action. You can list all the decaying models. We provide four decaying models, three or four, I don't remember exactly, by default, just to give an example, but obviously that's something that you would need to adapt to fit your needs. Uh, let's see how you can configure it. So this is uh, not this one. Uh, is it this one? No. Wait. Oh, no, it's not this one. It's the decaying model tool. Uh, and then you can pick the one you want to edit. So in my case, it would be the first one. Um, then you can select on the left side which attribute type you want this model to be applied. Um, and on the right side, the different parameters. So you can specify the threshold, you can specify the lifetime, so how long should an attribute be kept in the in the system, well, in the export, careful of what I'm saying, and the decay speed, so how fast should an attribute lose point over time. Uh, and once you're happy with it, you can enable it, uh, and when you use the API, uh, you, will, you will be able to, like, filter out based on, on that information. We have the documentation on the uh, open API specification. Just to give a few, you can just use this option, include decay score, you set it to one, and it will attach the decay, the computed decay score in the attribute. And you can also request MISP to exclude all IOCs that has been marked as decayed or expired by the model. So one last thing to say is, even though we have that system that is expiring IOC, it's not removing data from the database. It's just a filtering layer that is applied whenever you're exporting data. So we cannot use that system to delete data from your MISP instance. It's basically a system that is applied after you've collected all the data to be exported. You pass it into this decaying system. It will remove the IOCs that do not match or that are expired and then give you the final result. But nothing block you to create a Python script using the overlay mm -hmm. result to basically block your delete and those kind of uh, instance. In the question that we had, um, Mo was basically sharing with us the parameter of a decaying models mm -hmm. with a lifetime of 45, a decay speed of zero, a threshold mm -hmm. of zero. Yeah, that was a decay speed uh, So the cutoff uh, base score is uh, zero and then 45. And you say that, however, this model is not being applied. Um, maybe you have to make sure you select the attribute types. Yeah. If you don't select any, it will not be applied to any. Yeah, so that's maybe the, the thing because it's, it's not mentioned there. Mm -hmm. it's... Yeah, and then you have to also enable it in the interface. So if you list the decaying, you have to make sure that the it's Mo, ready. Mo say in the chat, selected attributes. Because that means he selected the attributes. Mm -hmm. That should work. So yeah. uh, nevertheless, 
uh, IPR selected and model is enabled. Okay, so that, sh that should work with even if you have this one is basically you have no cutoff, so that means after 60 in this example, after 66 days is uh, completely expired. Um, um, but that, 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 should, uh, that should work, yeah. Um, I'm a bit surprised of that comment. But yeah, it's the me, first time I too. hear it. Yeah, but because it's, it's working for the others, so that, that should work. Yeah. So if you have an example that you can share in the GitHub issues, we can have yeah. a look. Yeah, Just um, create an event, dump the, the event content in the issue, um, dump the model uh, configuration in the issue, and then we can have a look. Uh, without having the full configuration of the model and the full event, it's a bit hard for us to... Mm. to there is an additional uh, question concerning the decaying. How is uh, the retention taxonomy? Yes. Yes, I, I've seen this one. Okay, great. Uh, so this one, you would. Okay, I didn't want to spend too much time on the decaying, but it seems really something that is interesting to inter uh, that people are, in, are interested in. Um, we have the polynomial extended uh, formula. Polynomial is the standard one. Polynomial extended uh, is the polynomial uh, functionalities, uh, but we added a support of the retention taxonomy on top of it. So it is the standard uh, taking an expiration, but then uh, the retention taxonomy has the final says on what should be expired or not, basically. Uh, so yeah, just if you want to use it with the retention, select the polynomial extended and then it will take into account the, this uh, these tags from the retention taxonomy. Yeah. And in the retention taxonomy, you have basically numerical value, which are the use for the decaying model. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll just miss training. I just want to provide the slides for this one because it has a lot of information there. Um, and then we can move on. Yeah, great. I will use the link to the retention for the taxonomy. Yep. There we go. What is this on the agenda? Um, Miss module import enrichment. Uh, okay. Yeah, we try to cover today all the different use cases. Um, mm -hmm. So the API, so the PyMISP direct call, the PyMISP uh, extended version, and so on. Now we are looking to the Miss modules, which is Python again. It's external to MISP independence, uh, but Sammy will show you some yep. additional example there. Uh, so this is the repository for MISP modules. This is where you would find modules responsible for doing expansion or basically the enrichment service uh, for doing custom export format and for doing imports. So if you remember yesterday, um, we used the populate from and we use the URL import uh, import module. And I will show it once again how it works. So if you provide an URL, you click on import, and automatically it creates a URL object out of this, uh, well, simple URL. And if you submit, you have to wait a few seconds, and then you have your URL object created. So what I want to show you is how easy it is to create that kind of feature in MISP. So this one is an import module. So for that, we have to go into the import mode. You can see that we have a lot of different import modules by default, but we'll have a look at the URL import one. So you can see this is the code, the complete code uh, to, to have this functionality. So let's have a look quickly. This is a copy paste. You don't have to do anything. It's the same for all modules. This is a copy paste. You don't have to do anything. This is the same for all modules. This is a copy paste. You don't have to do anything. Okay, I think you've got it. Uh, the only thing that you have to implement is this one, the handler, um, which is the function that is executed whenever it receives a request from MISP. So what we are doing, we are collecting the request, uh, well, loading it into an object that we can use. And then you have to return uh, the final result that should be uh, added to the event. So what we are actually doing there 
um, is retrieving the uploaded data if it was submitted as a file. So it's even even more advanced because you can either choose to like paste it or you can provide a file. So that's why we have the, the differentiation. Uh, otherwise, you can just use the config. And then I'm calling this generate data. So this generate data will actually convert my URL into MISP objects. So you can see I have, uh, well, the data. So what was submitted there? As we saw yesterday, you can submit multiple URLs. So that's why I have this for loop. So for each URL that was submitted, I'm using a library called FOP that allows me to uh, basically parse an URL. And then with that, we saw it's how to create object in PyMISP. So I'm creating a MISP object of type URL. And I'm then I'm adding, I'm adding the attribute to, to this object. So I'm adding the URL, which can be the full URL. Then I'm adding, let's say, the query string. So I'm using the, the parsed uh, URL using FOP and accessing the query string uh, result. Same for resource, same for scheme. So you can see it's really easy. I just had parse my URL using the library FOP, and then I just assign it and create new attribute to my object. And once I'm done creating this object, I'm just happening it, appending it to my list of objects. And then I just return it as a JSON to MISP. And that's basically it. So you can, if you are, if you have to encode a lot of URLs, uh, you can use this module right away. You can also copy paste it uh, and change it for different type of objects. Uh, it's pretty straightforward and being able to do that kind of task. So to exploding URLs into objects is something that people tend to do by hand. But if you invest 10 minutes, I mean, it's pretty cool to have it in the user interface. As you can see, the communication between the MISP and the MISP modules are, are standard in this format. So basically, when you use PyMISP, functions to create attributes, objects, and so on, it will be reflected back into MISP as a standard object and so on. So it's it's really, really easy to, uh, to interact between the two systems. Just realize that the slide I sent was mm. interesting. Uh, so Daniele has a question. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch how to add my custom modules into existing modules in order to for MISP to integrate it. It's super straightforward. So the MISP module that uh, uh, Sammy was uh, showing into the uh, uh, GitHub repository is basically a standalone system. Uh, if you want to add a new module, you create a Python script, depending on the type of module, import, expansions, and so on. And then you uh, reload the services. You put in the ini uh, directory, uh, ini files, the modules names, and you just start your, your module. So that's really, really it. Um, we, we have a, a, a slide deck of 12 slides for how to use uh, create MISP modules. Um, so it's, you can just expand it and reload the MISP services, uh, the MISP module services, and automatically MISP will uh, detect the new module uh, expansions or import export uh, directly. So what's next? Um, yeah, for the enrichment, it's really similar. Just want to show an example for the enrichment as well. Um, what is this country code easy enough? It is easy enough. So this is a module that uh, extract the country code from a domain or store host name. Uh, so you can see these ones are exactly the same that we had previously. The handler function just collect the request and return what needs to be enriched or added to the event. And we have this uh, small uh, code that actually do the work. So parse country code that parse the country code based on an extension. So you can see it's really easy also to write uh, enrichment modules. And I think we even have it for the URL as well. So if you created a URL attribute instead of using the uh, URL uh, import, you can also do the extraction using an enrichment. And you can see it's exactly the same. Oh, yeah, exactly the same as the previous one. Okay. So next is custom export format. I will be really brief about that. It's just so that you know that it exists and how, how you can achieve that. 
So whenever you're using the API, maybe I can take back uh, the Jupyter Notebook, uh, you might remember that you can provide a return format when you are using REST search. So you can return data into JSON, CSV, RPZ, Suricata, Bro, whatever. So all of these exports, oops, uh, you can find the list uh, in the documentation, like in this one. But in some cases, uh, you might want to have your own export format. Um, sometimes it happens. And the, you can always do it. Uh, I will not show it because uh, it's a bit uh, tedious. I mean tedious because it's not Python. This is PHP. This is the programming language of MISP. Uh, but if you are willing to get your hands dirty, uh, you can always create your own export format that way. The advantage of using that instead of using the, the, the Python one is uh, all the different filtering and function that are already existing in MISP, but also the pagination that you can also affect. While if you are using the PyMISP, you would get the whole export that then you would have to convert afterward. So I will also provide a slide for this one so that you have a look if you are interested in how to create that. Uh, there we go. Okay. And now on to automation aspect. So we have um, three main ways to automate things in this. The first one we've covered it for the past hour, it's the API. So we can always create scripts that use the MISP API. And if you want to have uh, automation running every minute or every hour, you can always put this script in a cron job. Uh, the second way to add automation is to use and to rely on the ZNQ channel. Now, what is the ZNQ channel? We show an example. Oops. There on the side. In MISP, we have a publish subscribe channel where MISP acts as a publisher and you can have a script acting as subscribers. So if you're not familiar with ZenQ, maybe you are familiar with Kafka. This is the almost the same thing. So anytime something happens in BISP, it will be reflected onto the ZenQ channel. So right now, this is just a heartbeat so that the channel stays open. But let's try to add an attribute. And you will see on the right side what's going to happen. We have some audit logs that were created, and we have a JSON misp JSON attribute on the misp JSON attribute channel. We have the attribute that was created. Uh, so if I try to let's say modify the event, change the distribution level, you can see that automatically we have a message sent onto that channel. So a, a very nice way to have instantaneous integration with MISP is to rely on this channel to basically pass the content that is sent in this channel and then execute the logic right after. So just to show how, what it looks like and how easy it is to integrate. Oops. Um, so we have a few options at the beginning, but basically you have a while true loop, you just <laughs> iterate over all messages and you call the handle message function that takes care of, well, doing some stuff. And so in this one, you can filter out on the topic and then you can execute potentially actions. So if you would like to, let's say, um, send a notification each time an event has been published and it has the TLP red tag and it's about ransomware, mm -hmm. what you would need to do is to just add a if misp json underscore event and then look for the tags if the tags are matching then i don't know send the notification using uh, a mattermost client the slack client uh, discord client or microsoft teams client or whatever so it's extremely easy to to add this kind of direct integration all right so that was the 
second way to automate things. The thing that is very really nice here, it's you don't need to have API access. It's mm -hmm. super fast. Um, so if you, you for example, uh, process a lot of data in your MISP instances, you want to have a continuous stream of data every time something is happening and, and then it, this is really the way to do it. Um, maybe the, the way that Sammy will show after with the workflow, is, it's, it's an easier way, but this one is more like, I would say the uh, PubSub channel is really for the one that are uh, crazy about pipelines, uh, automatic feed of data and stuff like that in, into MISP. Um, that's one way to do it. Yeah, uh, yeah one last note about this LMQ channel. This is only accessible on the server itself. So it's not something that you can subscribe over uh, like uh, HTTP or WebSocket. Um, so that, but also anything that happens in MISP is reflected onto that channel. That means there are no ACL at all involved. So even if, if you create something, an event like that should be restricted, it will be seen on the, uh, on the channel, if you create users, it will be uh, displayed on the channel and so on. So really do not uh, expose that channel to anyone uh, unless you are the site administrator of the server. All right. And now the last part is by using the last part of automation in MISP is by using the feature that we have, uh, which is called the MISP workflows. So let's have a look. So in MISP workflows, we have, um, how can we describe it in a few words? These are basically a sequence of action that will execute whenever something happens in MISP. So we have a list of triggers, uh, for example, event published. So in this case, whenever an event is published, this workflow will be run. For example, whenever uh, an attribute is about to be enriched, this workflow will be run. Um, you can do, we have also some for users, we have some for a saving event. So these are the actions that are currently supported. Let's have a look at one workflow. Let's say this one, and I hope it's not too big. Hmm. But this one seems to be massive. Yeah, it is. Anyway, it's a bit complex, so I will just showing a really simple example. So this is a starting point where you have uh, an event that is about to be published. And what you can do is you can uh, save uh, a sequence of action with filtering on what should happen whenever an event is about to be published. So what you could do is, for example, you could say, OK, I want to enrich my event with, uh, what do we have? Did I take make sense? Mm. Yes. Yes. And so now if you save it, whenever an event will be published, it will be automatically enriched using the DNS module. What else could you do? Uh, you could say, okay, whenever an event uh, is published, I want to um, send the message on the Mattermost channel. So you do that. Uh, you can configure this module and say, for example, a uh, new event has been published. Then you can provide uh, information about this event. So the title is title of the event is, and then you can do event dot title. Looks good. Now you can save. If, for example, you would like this message to be sent only if a specific tag is present, you can use filtering modules or logic modules, sorry, and say, for example, that I want to I need to connect them like this. I want to send a message only if my event is tagged with JLP green. And if it's not, if it's tagged with JLP green, I can also say, in this case, I want to send, uh, let's send a mail this time to uh, an administrator saying that uh, this is the mail subject and the mail body would be event warning, event published. 
without the JP. And then same, I can also provide the title of the event uh, with, and also the amount of attribute. goes we can save and there we go now whenever an event will be published um, it we will check if the event is typed with JP green if it's typed with JP green we send a message on that or most and if it's not we send the mail so you can see you can add really simple automation uh, by just drag and dropping and connecting stuff so we have a question from uh, your peer mm -hmm. about if you want to add attribute on the event in Mathermos, it's possible. Uh, that's a different story there mm -hmm. because it's it's more like the trigger itself is not within this, but the trigger itself is within Mathermos. The example that Sammy show is basically notification scheme. So that means Mathermos is used um, as a notification shell. Uh, but there is, as far as I remember, there is a Mathermos uh, bot. Mm -hmm. I remember who did it? Which is available where you can basically interact from Mathermos to, uh, to MISP. And that's, I think it's straightforward to do because it, with PyMISP and so on, you can expand it. But in the case of workflow that Sally is showing is actually the trigger point and it shows all the trigger is actually the MISP platform itself. Then there's a second question from Rose Frazio about can workflow also allow to merge attribute from events? And our answer is no. There is not, no modules that allows you to do that. Uh, but the question that I have back is, why would you do that uh, as a workflow? That seems interesting to do. I think it's interesting, but dangerous. Yeah. Uh, so you, you can merge event, uh, but that's not something that is common. And in my opinion, not something you would like to automate. Mm -hmm. At least that's my... Yeah, if you have this case, take. just share it on, on share us with us on GitHub issues and we can have a look at um, because we have kind of what we call blueprints with predefined things, so we see another thing. Then we have Sam asking good questions. Can we add new tags to attributes even when it's published in workflow? I would say yes. You would say uh, I say it's even better than that. Ah, so you may So see that. I have I have there a small workflow and we'll go through it uh, so that I can explain what's going on. So in this case, whenever an event is about to be published, we are attaching all warning lists to this event. So we would have all warnings related to uh, that are enabled on this instance. So if we have a false positive, like the one we saw previously, like 8888, which was uh, an IPv4 public DNS resolver, we would have this warning attached. Then this module, which, which you would need to have a small tutorial on how to, to correctly use the, the workflow um, feature because it's quite complex as you can guess uh, for filtering at least. But this one is basically filtering uh, um, all the attributes that have false positive warnings. So at that point, we only have attributes that are marked as false positives. And in this one, uh, we have a look at a tag in the event or uh, in the attribute, uh, that's uh, it's about mutability. If mutability of the data is allowed during the work, the execution of the workflow. So just for uh, simplicity, let's just say that it is allowed. And then what do we what do we do with all these attributes that are marked as false positive? Well, first of all, this module will disable the IDS flag, so that they will not be considered as false positive anymore by MISP. Then what do we do after all? We are adding tags. So to reply to your question, it is absolutely possible to add tags on the event, but also on attributes. So in this case, we're adding tags and we're adding the tag false positive. We're adding the tag action taken, IDS flag removed, and we're adding the tag analysis false positive. And at the end, we just remove the filter so that back to that point, we have access to all attributes again. So why do we have this complex stuff of filtering, like filtering the attributes and removing the filter? It is for you a means to chain these different uh, pipelines. So we have a uh, lot of blueprint that are 
available for you uh, or by default. So you can just quickly take it, drag and drop it, and it will create this one is massive blueprint. It's a nice one. It's but it, this is a very nice one indeed. So I can do this. Just, just at the same time to answer questions when uh, Sam is moving box around. Yeah. Um, it's um, there's a good question from Jorge Polo about can I send mail to the user who recreated the event if some required information is missing? Yes, and that's exactly why the workflow were created is to have a validation process. So if you are missing, for example, a specific I don't know attributes. Uh, specific tags, classifications, and so on. You can automatically send an email notification to the users. Don't publish it and say, oh, we did the validation, but we are missing, for example, the CLP classification. So you can do it. Um, the other question is, um, can we add variables like dynamically adding events title in the emails? Yes, uh, because the templating, and I don't recall the name of the templating in Python. Jinja2. Right, so it's Jinja2. So if you have Jinja2 documentation, you can look at the macro. It's exactly the same macro that you can use in, uh, ah, yes, you have a nice documentation. So Sam is showing you documentations. And they see. Uh, oh, I'm they... sorry, I forgot to add it. Oh. Because I had a complete documentation on how to use Jinja. Okay. Uh, what, what is supported, but I forgot to add it. Okay, so... next time then. <laughs> next time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So yes, uh, for to answer the question that we have on the first one is, is yes, yes, and yes, and yes to all of those. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, word is so massive with adding filters and removing filters is because you can change them. So this is the entry point. This is the, let's say, the initial workflow that we've covered. Then you can take the output of this one, plug it in the input of the the blueprint that we created, and do the same for this one. Now you might be wondering what are these uh, blueprint doing? This one is, uh, what is it doing again? This one is doing an enrichment on using the Google Safe Browsing. So this one enrich attribute with Google Safe Browsing and based on the maliciousness uh, from Google, uh, we remove the IDS flag and we add tags basically. And this one is doing the same, but not using Google Safe Browsing, but this time using um, abu abuse like PDB. And it's doing exactly the same. And by chaining them, we are basically building a curation pipeline uh, that uh, that can be used uh, to like avoid false positive and provide more context to your data. Uh, if you are curious, I will give you a link with all the existing blueprints so that you can have a look at mm -hmm. those. It's an external repository, um, meaning that you can contribute to those ones. So uh, uh, if you want to uh, to create your own and it's nice, you can just export it from the user interface. And just uh, contribute it uh, directly into uh, into uh, into uh, Miss Blueprint. I'm sad that I forgot to add the Jinja documentation. But well, it was a good discussion. And the question, well, the question was good because we see that we are missing one piece of documentation there. So um, yeah, I just put it in the chat so you can you can see that this one is the actual uh, blueprint that are available. Oh. Yes, uh, I like to say yes for this question. Can more workflow be parallelized starting from the same trigger? And yes, and then uh, I think Sami is already showing an example with that. Let's say that we have this one. Oh, no, actually, we do something that makes yeah. sense. So you, you can have parallel and uh, sequential one. So both are possible. Okay, okay, let's do it differently. Uh, let's send email a, a message or an email. It doesn't really matter. Uh, actually, I will do what you said with an email so that you can see both. Yeah. Um, so when you have that, oops, this is um, actually this is not really applicable for this one. So I will just show it like this. You can indeed parallelize execution. You have to use the concurrent task module. This one accepts multiple output, multiple concurrent tasks. So what you can do, you can do this and this. And in this case, these ones will be run in parallel. So afterward, you can say, for example, uh, that you want to add a tag. Oh, this is tag replacement. So let's say that you want to add a tag, this one and then add another tag for this one. This is the kind of stuff that you can do with... Uh, so for example, after, after notification, you can say you have a tag notified, for example. Yeah. 
for example. Uh, I think it's answering the question of Daniele. Thanks for the question, because it was a good question. Mm. And this one can be placed anywhere in the blueprint, so uh, or anywhere in the in the workflow. So if you have this, this huge blueprint, yeah, don't worry, I'll leave it there. And you would like to, I don't know, uh, do the IDS operation, add the tag, but then you want to add the tag and at the same time, uh, actually I could have done something better just to show you a cool trick. Thanks. So I think it's working on the yeah. damn it, fail. Uh, anyway, let's do this. Could do this, this, and then uh, for example, a webhook. So if you have a custom service, you could uh, run a webhook on this. And you see the order is not very important here because yeah. you basically tag and you notify to the webhook. If one is run before the other, it doesn't matter. And no worries. That's, uh, I mean, we had so many good questions. I'm really happy that we had yeah, it was so, so much interaction today. We are just on time. Yeah. Uh, a huge, huge, huge thanks to everyone mm -hmm. who participated, uh, especially the good question that we, we received today. Some idea for improvement for me, so that's always great. Um, all the video uh, will be on the, our YouTube channel, on Circle Luxembourg. Um, so don't hesitate to have a look afterwards. Uh, and we will do sessions later. Again, thank you very much and take care. Thank you, everyone.